audio check.
Well, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It's nine o'clock, so the inquiry is resumed. Um, can I just check there's a fresh attendance list circulating today? Good, thank you. Again, can you all put your details on it, please, even if you're not going to be speaking today? Um, and mobile phones, if you've got one with you, again, please make sure it's switched off or on silent whilst the inquiry is sitting. Thank you. Um, anything from yourself, Mr. Leader, before I hear from Mr. Banner? No, thank you, sir. Okay. Mr. Banner. You both hard copies, if you'd like. Um, please, yes. I'm, I'm slightly confused. I, I did see th this morning that something came through from you, uh, but I could only get it on my phone. And my, my computer here tells me that my inbox is up to date and, and there's nothing there. So, okay. Thank you. I beg your pardon? If you need it re emailed at this stage, please do let me know and I'll. Yeah, well, I'll do that. Hopefully, we'll come. I say, I think that it's. Uh, <laughs> my, my phone indicates that it's, it's arrived. Um, but not there. No. We'll, 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 we'll see what <laughs> let happens. Let me know, and I say, I'm happy to, happy to be aggressive. Thank you. So, um, to start off with, by, so by way of introduction. Uh, what we don't do in this response is deal with every single point made in the application, not because we don't uh, we agree with every single point, but we're just trying to focus on the key issues that we think help you determine what to what to do in light of that note and application. And uh, we break the our response down into three headings: the, the plans issue, uh, what are the plans that you have to determine? Has there been material changes, weak cross changes, etc.? Secondly, uh, the application to exclude evidence, and thirdly, the application for an adjournment. Um, so we break that down into three headings, as you'll see in the note. So dealing with the plans issue first, um, <clears throat> in relation to what plans we rely upon, we refer you back to that 11th of February note from, uh, or letter from Barton Wilmore that was um, sent to the council and, and, uh, your, and PINs on that date, uh, consistently with what's said in Mr. Clarkson's rebuttal, which was set out a few days earlier. Um, the critical point being that in relation to the planting plan, it's explained, if you, if you do have that letter to hand, uh, you see in the second and third pages, um, the, the three different plans as, as how they have um, evolved are shown there. And I'd suggest quite a good litmus test of weak cough compliance is you do have to look relatively hard to spot the difference. Um, none of the built form, none of the actual houses or the, the critical built form has changed. Um, I'm not going to repeat the context of that letter. It's all set out and you will have read it. That you'll reread it before you make your decision uh, on that. But the key element of the change that appears to be complained about is the, the planting plan, which is Y13. And obviously, with hand in hand is the planting schedule. The text effectively goes mm -hmm. to the plan Y14. Now, so then the... The first question then is, is, well, has there actually been a material change at all? Or sorry, has there been a change at all in terms of what we are asking you to grant permission for? Because that's the key test in any sort of weak cough type scenario. And in relation to the uh, planting arrangements, um, we say in, in reality, no, there hasn't been because of that draft condition 12 I drew to your attention yesterday. Because draft condition 12 had the effect of making the original planting plans, Y13 and 14, provisional only. Um, you've seen what that condition says, I won't repeat it, but critically it said further details or final details of the proposals were to be submitted and approved in writing. So they were not definitive plans. Um, and the, this is the paragraph four of the note, that the differences, as you see in this, let's say the Barton Wilmore, the differences between the, the planting plan that Mr. Clarkson's rebuttal relies upon, that's figure one, the February 22 one, and the, um, the earlier versions uh, are minor, we say, on any view. Um, and they are critically within the parameters of what would have been capable of being submitted, approved in, under dra draft condition 12 in the event permission had been granted by the council. So again, testing this, if members had followed the professional advice and granted planning permission with that condition, uh, would it have been possible to submit the Clarkson rebuttal plan under condition 12? And we said, yes, it would have been. So therefore, nothing's changed in terms of the, of the parameters of the permission that's being um, uh, put forward. Uh, if that's wrong, it's plainly a very minor change and one that's 
amply within the parameters of, of Wheatcroft as interpreted by the Hoban Hobe Studios case. So then five, therefore, we say that actually the proper analysis that in relation to planting, there's been no variation in the parameters of what we're seeking permission for, namely planning permission subject to the future submission and approval of a final planting scheme pursuant to condition in the same or similar form to draft 12. And uh, what we envisage the final planting scheme to look like is that set out by Mr. Clarkson in his rebuttal, the February 22 plan. Um, if that's wrong and there has been a change in relation to planting, it's minor, it's weak off compliant. The next point, which is paragraph six of the note, is the, um, the point about the two remnant orchard trees that were always going to be removed from their location to make way from the road, but instead of them being taken off site and goodness knows whatever done to the, the wood, the proposal now is to keep them on the site, to move them somewhere else on the site because they have ecological, they will have ecological value, alive or dead, somewhere else on the site. Mm -hmm. um, and in relation to that, we say the three things set out at A, B, and C. So the first is, it really is a minor refinement in planning. We're talking about two trees that were always going to go. They were going to be taken off site. They're going to be moved on site. Um, I mean, that's not even, it's not to change the extent of the development within the meaning of section 755 of the Town and Country Planning Act. It's also something which doesn't require any alterations to the plans or the parameters to be fixed by the grant of permission in relation to planting. Um, I'd say it's, it's arguable either way whether moving a, a dead and, or translocating a live and potentially dying in the process tree somewhere else is actually planting. It doesn't seem to me to quite fit the normal concept of planting. And if it doesn't amount to planting, it, it, it's not relevant for the planting plan at all. So therefore, nothing changes. If it is planting, then, um, well, its delivery is within the parameters of the variability of those plans, same point in relation to condition 12. And it could have been something that could have been submitted and approved under condition 12 if permission had been granted. And I ask you also to note that you know, putting these trees somewhere else on site as opposed to taking them off site wouldn't itself require planning permission or affect the scope of the mission sorts or plenty of TPO trees. The, the removal of them in the first place would have required authorization. That is so. But once that, that was always sought, then what you do with them afterwards mm. it wouldn't, doesn't affect the price of the permission. So it's a complete non-point. And thirdly, um, of course, this was a point that was first made in Mr. Clarkson's main proof, and that's not objected to. Uh, the council had it for four weeks, and so therefore um, this ought not to be within the scope of the application or, or note anyway. And that then leaves the change um, to the footpath, and there has been a change to the indication of the footpath. One has to look fairly hard to see why well, it's a hogging path, so hardly you know, a, a motorway or a metal road or anything like that. It's, it's very minor in its, um, its footprint. And we say at seven that there really are, in, in the context of the overall development proposal, which is how it must be seen, they, um, I mean, they're so minor that we say unhesitatingly they would have qualified as non-material amendments under section 96a again quite a useful test not not um we don't need to go that high to say it's weak off compliant but plainly if they would be the nmas that's the end of the matter and i suggest it's frankly a no-brainer that you could have nma that had we got consent previously and wanted to um tweak the hogging path in the way that the evolution of, of the scheme has shows on those two pages of the barton wilmore note Irrespective of whether that's right, they're plainly compliant with the Wheatcroft principle, and <coughs> I, I ought not, I don't, I don't set it out here because we all know what the Wheatcroft principle is, but just to be clear, of course, there's two limbs to that as interpreted by Hoban Studios. One, has there been a change in the substance of what's been applied? Are we outside? Are we, are we trying to, to apply for a supermarket when we originally applied for a housing scheme? Obviously not. We're obviously not outside the four corners of what we're applying for. So we're plainly within the substantive four corners of, of the application. And then is there seriously uh, scope for unfairness in relation to um, the tweaks to the path? Um, I don't think anybody, I don't, I don't, I, I have read all the public notes and obviously you have, but we'll do mm. again. I don't recall anybody would take a point about the precise foot route of the path or anything like that. I think you can take it as read that members of the public aren't prejudiced about, about that. There are things they, are, they do care about. We've heard about them. It's not the precise route of the hogging path. And um, it's not actually been said how that route of the path changing has actually prejudiced the council as such. There's a point about biodiversity in that game. We'll come back to that. But that's not based upon the precise route. Um, so um, we say, therefore, this is plainly weak off compliant. If, if there really is some, some unfairness to the council in relation to the path moving, that can be cured by giving them an adjournment to deal with whatever flows from that change. And the only way they really complain about it is in the context of net gain. 
Um, then finally, um, Natural England's, the shadow of Natural England was raised by Mr. Leader's submissions, and we say in relation to that at paragraph 8 that the suggestion that Natural England's position might be affected by the above, materially affected, would they actually change their consultation advice? We say is untenable. Um, I mean, Mr. Leader, I, we all noted, said that the contents of the, of the Clarkson rebuttal plan was materially better, Mr. Leader, was, than its predecessors. We agree. That's why, that's why it's, it's being relied upon. But in any event, um, um, it, it, the final planting proposals uh, would remain, as before, the subject of further scrutiny pursuant to a condition in the same or similar form to draft condition 12. So it was always going to be the case that there was a provisional planting plan subject to submission approval of final details. That remains the case. Nothing has changed. Um, and when you go back and, and look at Natural England's uh, concerns, it's not, they're not bothered about whether one tree goes here or there. It's the principle of, of mitigation being in suitable mitigation to provide the necessary compensatory, or not compensatory, not quite the right word, but provide the necessary um, foraging and commuting opportunities to go in for the bats to, to effectively mitigate what would be lost and provided in principle that could be secured at the right time and we'll doubtless have a discussion about what that means in due course the by that principle is secured they don't, they don't they're not bothered about whether there's a purple dot here or a green dot there um, so it, it's unreal um, the, the council's objection in that respect so we say for all those reasons it, it we, we we have requested, we're going to make a formal application. There's not some statutory procedure where you have to stick an application form in an application fee in the way that Mr. Leader seemed to suggest we did yesterday. We've made very clear what we are seeking to rely upon. I reiterate that today, and we say um, it's untenable um, to suggest that we shouldn't rely upon it. So we humbly request you to proceed as we set out in my note in Mr. Clarkson's rebuttal and in Bart Wilmore's letter. I then turn to the second part of the, applica the, the application stroke note, and that's to, to exclude Mr. Clarkson's rebuttal. And I note that the way that that application is put is not to exclude particular paragraphs or particular parts, the whole lot. Um, and there's no alternative submission that if, if the whole lot isn't excluded in certain parts, are, and it's too late to, for him to do that in reply. And it's hopeless. It's a hopeless application because most of that rebuttal concerns points wholly unrelated to the particular issues about which the note of application relates, such as bats. We'll come back to that in, no doubt in, in due course. As I've noted already, the retention elsewhere on the site of the two veteran trees that are to be removed from their current location was set out in the main proof, not the rebuttal. So this, doesn't, this point doesn't go to whether or not you include or exclude the rebuttal. And in relation to Mr. Clarkson's, ref, Clarkson's reference to the February 22 planting plan, um, that's appropriate for the reasons I've given already, namely that the predecessor plans were always subject to the provision of further details. And it's inevitable in a uh, long-running uh, planning dispute that as further thought is given, further details are refined. That's the whole point of that condition, is to, is to see what, how best you can uh, improve the situation to get the best possible scheme. And that's what Mr. Clarkson has entirely in accordance with his professional duty needs to be commended, not criticised for what he's been doing. Um, so the, um, the, there's, there's no uh, inappropriateness in Mr. Clarkson referring to that planting plan. Um, the net gain calculations haven't changed. What's happened is that he has clarified the basis on which those calculations were made. Um, so the refinements were made. Um, so the, the, there wasn't erroneous reference to plans earlier on, but it's, it's, a, it's a complete storm in a teacup, the reason I've given, because the plans are always variable and refinable. What he does is simply clarify the basis on which the calculations which he stands by were made. Now, um, as I've said, the, the objection is really all really in the context of net gain, and that's, that's very clear. I don't need to take you through the paragraphs that Mr. Leader's notes. It's very clear that the concerns put forward in relation to the new planting plan are all to do with um, the calculation of net gain. Uh, and, and let's put this into context. In this paragraph 13 and 14 of, of my note, Mr. Phillips's proof was the very first time that the council explained what its position was in relation to net gain. The council's statement of case had a bare assertion that the council denied the scheme would achieve a net gain, there being no appraisal one way or the other in the officer report or the decision notice. Um, we're not going to bore you unless you want. If, if anything turns out, we will, but we're not going to labour you with the track changes, versions to and fro, the statements on the ground. But in negotiations, I said yesterday, on the statement of common ground, 
this, the appellant asked the council to elaborate on its reasoning, the, the bit that had net gain in, had a section saying, because dot, 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 and the council repeatedly refused to fill that in. Um, they refused to elaborate on its reasoning. And the whole point about asking the council to elaborate on its reasoning at that early stage of the Statement of Common Ground was to enable the differences between the parties on this issue to be understood and further common ground explored, much as you quite, well, may I say so, quite sensibly, sir, suggested ought to be done going forward now. That was the process we were trying to stimulate at that time. Um, the council didn't provide uh, that elaboration. The first time we understood the council's position on net gain was in Mr. Phillips's proof. And that meant that the first opportunity we had to engage with what the council was saying on, on net gain was in Mr. Clarkson's rebuttal. It couldn't have been earlier. Now, the background to all of this is as set out at paragraph 17 of, of my opening, as elaborated all in the key point being net gain calculations weren't submitted with the application because they weren't required at that time and they weren't requested by the council during the termination of the application and the council had formal power and informal ability to say you need to give us more material. They didn't do so. It didn't form part of the reasons for refusal um, and as I reminded everybody yesterday, in recent correspondence with PIMS, the council itself disavowed the suggestion in Mr. Phillips' proof that the reasons for refusal incorporate net gain. That's their letter of the 2nd of February. And you, sir, um, reiterated that yourself and made clear that this issue only goes to the extent of benefits that the appeal scheme would deliver. It's not a point that can hold up planning permission per se. It simply goes to the extent of benefits. And so this is at best a peripheral issue, which the council has blown out of all proportion. That plainly is relevant to the fairness and proportionality um, of what is, has been done on both sides. So therefore, we say that the, um, the, the evidence, it's not actually really properly, fairly described as late evidence, the reasons we've given, because the, uh, the plans were always variable. But even if it is, um, could it have been put forward earlier? No, because we didn't know what the council's position on that gain was, and so we didn't have the ability to respond sooner. Uh, is, is it relevant to, the, to your decision where well, it's relevant to an issue about the extent of benefits, and has prejudice been caused to the council? No. And if there had been any, could it be cured? Yes. Um, turning then to the application of the adjournment, um, the, dare I say, rather extraordinary application for a full adjournment has rightly been abandoned. I don't need to say anything more about that. We don't accept that adjourning the net gain issue and or veteran tease issue is necessary or appropriate. We, we remain content, We've, we have made an open offer <coughs> in the terms I set out yesterday and um, we maintain that open offer because once you make an offer you ought to stick to it um, on the terms proposed uh, yesterday. Um, <coughs> and, uh, but we don't think we actually, it's ne strictly necessary and of course it's open for you to decide that we don't need to do that. Um, adjournment of the entire ecology evidence which is really on the adjournment, the issue between that the parties. So Mr. Leader says not good enough to adjourn net gain and veteran trees as we have proposed that actually you should go further and adjourn the entire ecology evidence. We say that's completely unwarranted. Um, the habitat regulations issues, which dare I say, you know, for most people when you come to a case about ecology, that's number one on your list of things because it's the, it's a le there's legal requirements there as well as policy issues and there's natural England too. So that's so the way I look at any ecology cases are the any habitats issues first. And I, I venture to guess that's probably how most inspectors look at it too. Um, so that's a real issue actually in terms of ecology. And they don't turn on net gain. If they did, the council would have said something about it in, in considering uh, whether or not to grant permission. And Natural England might have said something about it in their statutory consultation, they didn't. And ditto, they don't turn on veteran trees. And again, nothing was observed in that respect by either the council or in Natural England in considering the HRA issues. And we suggest it's in the interest of the efficient running the inquiry, which you um, highlighted yesterday, to hear the habitats related assess, uh, evidence during the period currently allotted for the inquiry, I basically this week or next. And I make three points in that respect. Firstly, sir, it, it's obviously severable this issue from net gain or veteran tease. It's treated as se se separate in the experts' proofs. And you, know, you need to go back and have a look at that. I've prepared my cross-examination, Mr. Phillips, and I have struck, as you most embarrassed you, know, one, two, three, four, five headings, and it's a separate heading. It's heading number one, funnily enough. In fact, half the cross-examination. Um, so it's clearly severable. 
hearing it now um, minimise, and this is the really important point, particularly given the constraints on finding other dates because of the Council's other commitments for the next, and, and everybody's other commitments, is it minimises the amount of extra inquiry time needed after the period currently lost for the inquiry. And, to say, I, I, I do generally think so. It probably would make the difference. In fact, I'd say very probably make the difference between, aside for closings, which of course might be able to be done in writing if, if necessary, or at least on a Monday or whatever. I think it make the difference between a one or two days being needed. I mean, I've done the maths on the, as probably you've done and others have done, on the time and estimates. About half of my cross-examination, Mr. Phillips, is on habitats. If you hive off habitats, could you put on both sides, could you put two experts in the same room and get through net gain and veteran trees? In a, in a day, my judgment is you could. If you added on habitats, could you? My judgment is no way. So I think it really would make the difference, and that's quite important because that does raise the prospect of, of potentially, as you indicated, scheduling a Monday. Potentially, even it could be remotely if it was just too much to, for people to come and go for one day. We could slot it in and get this inquiry done quicker. Um, and we didn't necessarily have to have two days together for ecology and closings, whereas if it was two days for ecology, you clearly want them together. So it, I think it will make, make a real difference, and we have to bear in mind mm. Rosewell as well in the background uh, and the targets for timely determination of inquiries. And finally, there's nothing impractical or unusual about experts giving evidence to separate parts of an inquiry on separate or several issues. Uh, I, you've been expect, expect, I think, so longer than I've been a barrister, dare I say, so I'm sure you've come many, many ample experience of that. But, for example, it's not uncommon for the same witness to give five-year supply evidence at one part of an inquiry and then planning evidence at the later part of the inquiry. And he's not here, but Mr Dewson, who's the planning consultant for the, the next appeal, he, who who's, I'm, I'm acting for in that one, he's doing the five-year supply session, and then he's coming back to do planning evidence, and that's fairly common. Um, so it, it, there's no... Um, great problem or insurmountable problem in dealing it that way. If there really is a degree of small shade of overlap, which I don't accept there is, between any of the BNG or veteran tree issues and, and bat, or bats, then of course at the second stage we can have, you know, the experts can know in 10 minutes or so deal with that mm. potential overlap in a Venn diagram, but I really don't accept there is. And I mean, the only time Mr. Leader suggested there was was orally where he said he was instructed by Mr. Phillips that, that was the case. He didn't say what those instructions were, he didn't give any particulars and it's too late for him to do so in, in reply because this is my response to his argument. So for those reasons, sir, uh, I say that overall the, the plans that Mr. Clarkson and the Bart Wimmore letter seeks to rely upon um, ought to be uh, the basis of the determination for the reasons I've given. Um, the application to exclude the whole of Mr Clarkson's rebuttal is uh, without merit, and indeed it's without merit to exclude parts of it, though that's not asked for. And um, in terms of the adjournment, we didn't need to make the open offer that we did at the beginning of yesterday, um, but on any view, the Council can't do better than that. Unless you've got any questions, sir, that's my response. No, thank you, Mr. Van Rijn. Thank you for the hard copy. I'm still, still hasn't arrived, but but anyway, that's 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 neither here nor there. Thank you, Mr. Leader. Are you in a position to respond to Mr. Banner's comments now? Or do you want a, an adjournment first? Okay, well, it's 9, 9.25. If we take, is 15 minutes sufficient yeah. there? Okay, I'll adjourn then and we'll resume at 9.40. Thank you.
Well, it's 9.40, so the inquiry is resumed. Um, can I just say before uh, I invite you to respond, Mr. Leader, uh, I've been informed that not everyone who's spoken at the inquiry um, has actually had their microphone on when speaking. And I, although that's fine for the people in this room, um, I understand that the live stream doesn't pick up the, uh, uh, the, the, the voices un unless the mics are on. So can I just remind those who are speaking to make sure your, your red light's on the, Thank you. the microphone. So, Mr. Leader, please. Thank you, sir. Starting with the question of what is the scheme, you will have noticed that one thing my learner friend did not do was tell you what the scheme is. Is it December 2018? Is it August 2020? Is it November 2020? He'd like it to be February 2022, but actually, we still don't know, because my learner friend presumably doesn't know himself what the scheme is. And it's not surprising, to be fair to my learner friend, because he must act upon instructions. And since his own ecologist doesn't know, he can hardly be expected to know himself. Because you'll have noted that in the statement of case, Mr. Clarkson relies upon the December 2018 version of his case. Yet in his rebuttal, he relies upon the February 2022 version, which he says is, and I paraphrase, materially the same as that which uh, was the subject of the planning application. Well, yeah, what was that? We don't know, and we're entitled to know. And the reason we're entitled to know is that when you come to evaluate the evidence, so you're entitled to take account of two things, substance and credibility. I am entitled to make submissions on both. I'm entitled to explore both topics. And I can hardly be expected to do that if Mr. Clarkson is allowed to evade proper scrutiny by my learned friend introducing a plan which effectively supersedes the chaos that is his proof. Now, in his submissions on plans, my learned friend adopted the Paul Daniels approach. A good magician gets his tricks home by distracting the audience, getting them to fix their eyes on something other than the particular trick they are performing. How does he do that? He does that by taking you to core document B1, and in particular condition 12, and you'll have noticed that in his submissions he focused very much on the planting plan in Y13 and 14. Well, that was interesting, but as I hope, helpfully alerted my learner friend to yesterday, what draft condition 12 doesn't do is A, define the scheme, or B, focus on the key plan, which is Y12. The plan the appellants cannot seem to nail down. So, condition 12 doesn't help my learned friend at all. All it does is seek to distract you from the primary question, which is, what is the scheme? We don't know. And you don't get any assistance from Y12. Now, does any of this matter? Yes. Why is that? Well, we could start with my learner friend's own words, made in an extemporary way as an elaboration to his submissions. The scheme of February 2022 is, to quote my learned friend, materially better according to the council, what does he say? We agree. That's why it's relied upon. To quote my learned friend from about 15 minutes ago, it's materially better, that's why we, we rely upon it. Good. Well, then we can all agree that the council's entitled to know all about it 
And if it's materially better, perhaps my learned friend would like to tell me how he knows that, given that we still do not have any measurements or calculations upon which to base that assertion, not from him and not from his witnesses. So, given that my learned friend says it's materially better, given that he relies upon it for that reason, well, perhaps we could have the evidence that he seeks to use to get that point home, because we haven't got it yet. Now, that gets us back to the fairness point. It might well suit my learned friend to make these amendments, drive the inquiry on, and get it home in the time scale allotted, so that we can't have the evidence that he relies upon to, to prove his BNG case if he's able to. But here's a point. It may well be his new evidence is materially better. But let us remind ourselves as to what the council's case is. The council does not accept Mr. Clarkson's initial assessment of the scheme as producing a biodiversity net gain. If you would care, sir, before you make your decision, to look at page 27 of Mr. Phillips' evidence, his summary and conclusions, his calculations, based upon the evidence that Mr. Clarkson has seen fit to produce in the form of measurements and calculations, at paragraph 4.3.17 indicates an overall net loss of minus 17.67% for habitats and 0% for hedgerows. So, it's not a case of as my learned friend would seek to portray, minor differences, making no difference and only helping the appellant by increasing the biodiversity net gain, we say, actually, they first of all got to prove there's any biodiversity net gain at all. And given that's going to be a live issue between us, it would be rather helpful to have the measurements and calculations upon which the latest assessment is based. Because as far as we're concerned, they start off from a significant deficit. So, oh, it's no difference, doesn't really wash once one has regard not just to the appellant's position, but also to the council's. Now, as for, I think it said, natural England, they're not bothered. Well, here's the news. After we became aware that the appellants had decided to resist what seemed to the council to be a perfectly fair compromise, which was to adjourn off ecology and biodiversity. We wrote to Natural England yesterday. I've asked for the reply that we've just received to be copied and provided to you and my learned friend, because actually they are bothered. They would like to be consulted on the latest proposal, which is hardly surprising and doubtless, sir, you'd expect them to be consulted anyway. Why is that? Because they've been consulted on a false basis, it would appear. That is not really to do with the February 2022 scheme at all. It's to do with the fact that um, they were operating on the assumption that this scheme is to be judged by a scheme dated from December 2018, whereas it would appear, though who knows, the November 2020 scheme was later substituted. We can't tell, but we think it probably was. And that definitely does show a worse position in terms of biodiversity net gain as a result of the hogging foot path along the Stowey Rhine. How much worse, we don't know, because not the measurements and calculations now. So Natural England actually do care. They are bothered. But not only Natural England, of course, we have Yakwag, who are interested in this matter, and might be expected to be bothered once they know the extent to which the scheme has morphed. So, fairness dictates that we be given a fair opportunity to respond to the latest proposed changes to the scheme. Now, as for the approach, I thought I'd made it pretty clear yesterday that the issue is one of unfairness. 
Therefore, we wanted a proper opportunity to see the appellant's case in the round and to respond in the round. As I indicated and I maintain, Mr. Phillips's view is that ecology, biodiversity net gain, should be tackled in the round because as far as he is concerned, though it may not suit the learned friend, and it may not be the way he's witnessed these matters, it is not possible to sever, on the one hand, bats and HRA matches generally, and on the other hand, biodiversity generally. That's our position. If my learned friend chooses to disagree with it, well, he can cross-examine Mr. Phillips on that subject, and we'll see where we get to. But speaking for myself, I intend to cross-examine Mr. Clarkson in a linear matter, in a linear manner, which takes him from the first erroneous arboricultural statement, which can't even get correct the tree that exhibits orchard tooth crust fungus. It manages to get that completely wrong. That then is the basis for the, the, that, then is, that then is the launch pad a great chunk of Mr. Clarkson's evidence. And, and then we just go through the car crash, which is the continuous confusion we see in his proof. Now, I therefore say, sir, that whilst it may suit my learned friend to approach the matter in one way, it doesn't suit me. It doesn't suit the council, and we're entitled to be able to do our job as we see fit within the bounds of what is reasonable. And it can hardly be said to be unreasonable that we are not provided with information that we need to do that job and then ask for the information to do it. So, what is the correct approach? Well, my learner friend said he sent uh, an open uh, correspondence to me suggesting we could split the biodiversity evidence up. Well, I, I made a response, which given his uh, uh, letter to me was open, my response must therefore be open. My response was, sir, and I can provide you with the email, no, um, but why don't we just hive off the whole of biodiversity and agree to adjourn that off, which the, the appellants have rejected. So the approach I'm taking at this inquiry was canvassed before it opened. I suggested we just hive off biodiversity and ecology, deal with it all on another day in an efficient way. That's been rejected, and my learned friend seeks to, seeks to take the approach that he takes. Well, I had thought our correspondence was not open, but since it transpires it is, that was my counteroffer, which was rejected. And, as I say, I'll produce the email if you wish me to. Um, so, sir, in all the circumstances, we do say this. Please adjourn biodiversity off. Please allow us to deal with the matter as a whole in a considered way. Please insist, before we adjourn biodiversity off, we know which plans the appellant says their scheme is based upon prior to February 2022, so we may be informed. And then let's get on with it. Because I will concede, sir, that if you adjourn off, they can put in their February 2022 scheme. I won't object to it going in at that point because we won't be prejudiced because we'll have a proper opportunity to respond to it in the round. Well, that's fine. I don't mind that at all. We, if it turns out that there is a biodiversity net gain, well, you need to know and I need to know, and quite frankly, it may shorten matters. Because if, if Mr. Phillips is persuaded by the calculations and measurements that come from Mr. Clarkson that actually we shouldn't pursue BNG, well then we won't, it's pointless to, it could actually help a great deal. I think that is everything <coughs> I wish to say, sir. So there's Thank a few you. new okay. points I'd quite like to come back to. On. Well, I'm sure my learned friend would, but I think I should have the last word, no, sir. because you mentioned yeah. Natural England, so. Yes, I mean, in, in, in terms of the application, obviously it's, um, Mr. Leader from the Council, so yeah. he will have the last word, but I'm more than happy to uh, allow you to, to you, respond, yes. and yes. then obviously I'll go back Thank to you. Mr. Leader again. Um, but just bear, bear with me a moment course, just so while take, I take your note get my, my note-taking in order. Okay, Mr. Banner, Thank if you, there's sir. some um, points you wanted to come back on. So, Again, I'm only going to deal with the points that help you rather than respond to every, 
all, all the hyperbole. Um, so firstly, so, um, in terms of what's changed and the, why, the point about this also affecting Y12, what's changed has been what's been shown in the Bark Moore letter. It's the planting and the pathways. In so far as that affects Y12, it's the same point. It's the same point. Um, namely, the planting was always variable. And it says, in, 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 you'll see the reason for draft condition child. It talks about landscape. I haven't got it before me, but the reason talks about landscaping. So it was always contemplated that the change of the planting may have knock-on consequences for landscaping. I mean, it would always be within your power to include Y12 and list of plans which could be supplemented by further details. It's mm -hmm. just a simple matter of, of adding a number into a condition. But nothing, nothing that... Um, has changed in relation to Y12 goes beyond the changes discussed in the Bark Memorial Letter. Planting, the moving of the trees, which doesn't really need to be shown in the plan anyway, we suggest, and, and the path. So it's the same point, and the same submissions are made in relation to Weedcroft. Um, Natural England. Um, we'd like to see the email. Um, it seems from the way that Mr. and not just the email from Natural England, the email to Natural England. It seems from the way Mr. Leader described um, their response, that they're interested in this point in the context of net gain, not in the context of bats. That's how he put it, which all plays to what we're suggesting is the way, sensible way forward, namely to defer net gain. I must say, so I'm bound to say, I'm disappointed and surprised that the council has seen fit to engage with Natural England uh, without having the courtesy of, of letting you or us know first. It's consistent with what Mr. Leader said in the emails in our wave, which is that there would be fun and games, his words, over this issue. Well, let's, let's cut the fun and games and let's help the inquiry. Um, actually, sir, nothing changes on that because under Regulation 63 of the Habitats Regulations 2017, subsection 3, says that where there's a, an appropriate, and I'm probably telling you what you already know anyway, but where, where there's an appropriate assessment required, which we accept this is an appropriate assessment, okay, well, but it's sensible because we rely on mitigation, so you can't screen it out, the competent authority must, for the purpose of the assessment, consult the appropriate nature conservation body and have regard to any representations made, that body, made by that body within such reasonable time as the authority specifies. And, of course, you're the competent authority now, which is why I do say it was, frankly, discourteous to the council to... to contact Natural England when you're the competent authority. It was for you to do that. Um, so you would anyway, if you were minded to allow the appeal after all of this, you'd have to consult them anyway. So the, the fact that there might be some reconsultation, well, that's going to happen anyway. And it would be informed by your appropriate assessment. And that information assessment would be informed by the debate we have. So nothing turns to the Natural England point. It's gamesmanship, frankly, and, and it should be deprecated. Um, so none of that really affects uh, the critical issue, which is for you, which is do we go with deferring net gain and or veteran? I mean, veteran fees is quite a small issue, but do we, those two, uh, or do we defer the whole of ecology? And finally, in terms of Mr. Leader's suggestion that he's going to do what he calls a linear cross-examination, whatever that is, um, can I just ask you to turn up Mr. Phillips' proof, page 16, if you've got it? Because um, obviously it's only right that an advocate should put um, the case... Um, that his client advances as opposed to a different case. And on page 16, um, we see how Mr. Leader's expert on behalf of the council characterizes the ecological related issues. Um, and you see a 4.1 between, I have split the chapter into two key sections. The first in relation to biodiversity interest, the second in relation to biodiversity net gain. And that's the structure of the evidence um, on behalf of the council. So to say that, there is, that, that the two can't be um, separated off in the way I've suggested, and if it really does transpire that there's a degree of, in the Venn diagram, a degree of overlap where the two circles slightly converge, I don't accept that is, that can be catered for uh, within the structure of the procedure that I've suggested is the way forward, sir. That's all I wish to say. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Mr. Leader. Everything's in the planting plan, is it? I don't think so, because if you read the chapter on biodiversity net gain in both Mr. Clarkson's proof and Mr. Phillips's proof, you'll see that biodiversity net gain 
is intimately affected by the extent to which species-rich pasture is covered in paths and roads. So I'm afraid it's not all about planting, but it is partly about planting and the way in which the appellant schemes lurch between, I think it's around about 21 new trees and 40 odd new trees, we'll work it out in due course. So actually, Y12 is a key plan. It's materially different in terms of its coverage compared with Y13, Y14, Y14 not being a plan at all. And it does go to the heart of the calculations of biodiversity. Right, the communications with natural England, gamesmanship, is it? No. My learned friend told you, and you'll have his note, you have, you have a note of what he said, natural England, they're not bothered to quote. Well, actually they are. So call it gamesmanship or call it diligence. I'd call it the latter. We thought it would be a good idea to ask them. It's plainly entirely appropriate for us to ask them. Do they need to be consulted? Yes, they do. Well, if they're going to be consulted, we might as well all carry on this inquiry in the light of what their consultation response says. That would seem to be like quite a good idea. Then, as for this suggestion, we sever the evidence. Well, if we're going to have the ecologists come along and provide us with their expertise, we might as well do so in one go. What's the point of splitting it? If they've got to come back, come back once. And actually, come back once, having had the opportunity to do so, what you suggested would be a good idea, which is provide a further statement of common ground. Because the point is this. It's not just about substance, I'm afraid, although it may be just about substance in terms of my learned friends cross example of Mr. Phillips. Because I'm afraid as far as the appellants go, my cross-examination goes to credibility as well. It will be a searching, detailed cross-examination, starting at the start and finishing at the finish. Everything Mr. Clarkson has got to say about the subject, for reasons that will be blindingly obvious. I shall want to explore, amongst other things, the way in which their, his case morphed at proof of evidence stage in the light of his site visit with Mr. Pierce and Mr. Banner, and then came to be reversed out in his rebuttal and referring all of that back to his statement of case, which seems to be a long time ago now. Um, and it will be, sir, a case of combining what he's got to say about HRA matters and what he's got to say about biodiversity. So that's my particular response to what Mr. Banner has, to, has just told you. Um, at the end of the day, you're probably fed up of hearing from both of us now, so unless Mr. Banner's got a response to make, that's my last word on the matter, sir, and I'd simply invite you to do this. Adjourn the ecological evidence as a whole to another date so that we can deal with it as a whole on another date. If you think about it, that isn't going to take up any more time than it would take up anyway, given that on my learner friends approach, if you don't hear all biodiversity today, we're going to have another date for ecologists. Mm -hmm. And I would agree with my learner friend that actually, that having been done, it's perfectly feasible to do closings in writing. So we don't need to extend the inquiry, whether one takes my learner friends approach or my approach. But what we will do is save the council the cost of having to have its ecologist along twice. Now, you might say, well, if you have to do that, that can sound in cost. Yes, it can. But actually, um, in view of the fact uh, we're trying to run this inquiry efficiently, let's just hear from them once. Can I assist you further, sir? No, that's fine. Thank you. I'll, uh... You'll need the letters. I'll provide those straight away. I think they've been copied. Email says so there's an email to them, an email back, you get the full trail. Okay. 
If, if I can have those, and then obviously I'll adjourn, I'll consider what's been put to me, and I'll come back and I'll tell you what we're going to be doing. Okay. So, h how quickly can they, those emails, be obtained? <laughs> Thank you. So I think I think I've got all then that I need to go away and consider. Is um, yeah, yeah. I'll have a look at that. Um, well, it's five past ten. I'm going to um, give, give, give myself half an hour here. So um, ten. I'll, I'll adjourn now and we'll resume at 10.35. Thank you.
Well, the inquiry is resumed then, ladies and gentlemen. So, um, I've considered the various points put forward by both sides. Dealing first with the plans, it seems to me that um, if I compare the December 2018 um, Y12 plan with that put forward in February 22, there are clearly some differences um, on the face of it, perhaps in purely visual terms, if I can put it that way, they appear to be fairly minor. Um, and as such, I don't think they materially change the substance of the scheme which was originally submitted and consulted upon. Um, and I say that because uh, I don't think that anyone with an interest in this case would be unduly and unacceptably prejudiced by me accepting the amended February 2022 plans as part of the scheme at appeal. So I'm therefore content that the appellant can put forward those February 22 landscaping scheme plans as part of the appeal proposal. In other words, the Y12, Y13 and Y14 plans dated February 2022. It is apparent, however, that because of the differences in the landscaping plans, the biodiversity net gain calculation put forward in the appellant's statement of case and Mr. Clarkson's proof of evidence cannot rate, uh, relate specifically to this February 22 landscaping scheme, such that additional information does need to be submitted to present an accurate and updated BNG calculation which accords with this latest scheme and upon which um, the, the council can question the appellant's witness. Of course, as we've discussed earlier, Natural England will also uh, need to be consulted on this February 2022 scheme. So, having heard and considered the arguments on both sides, I consider that the fairest way forward and the way forward that would be most helpful to me would be for the, <clears throat> the whole of the biodiversity ecology evidence for this proposal to be adjourned to a later date to be agreed. Um, I floated the other day my availability after this period, uh, this week, next week, the following week, but after that week commencing the 4th of April. So I'll just leave that on hanging at the minute, but that's um, my, my decision that we will, will come back and hear the whole of the biodiversity and ecology evidence. So, so if, if Y12, Y13 and Y14 are to be formally put forward as part of the scheme that I'm required to determine, the appropriate measurements and calculations relating to that scheme need to be su supplied to the council as soon as possible and obviously to me so, so the council can assess the proposal as it now stands at appeal. I note that um, Mr. Leader has also asked for detailed measurements and calculations relating to the earlier sets of plans, namely the December 18, August 20, and November 20, um, so that uh, evolution of the scheme, as it were, can be followed. I think that would also be helpful to be provided. So that means that um, while we're here, we're all here this week, um, I'll expect us to work through the remaining evidence this week and next if necessary and then come back at a later date um, whether that be within this three-week period or whether it be April or beyond um, to hear ecology um, and the time required for that of course may take less than is currently envisaged depending on what agreement may be reached with the respective witnesses and statement of common ground, hopefully that can be prepared on that matter. 
I don't. I don't think there's a lot more I need to say at the minute. I, I haven't reworked the draft inquiry timetable on the basis of what I've just said. It does seem to me that we're, we're going to take the rest of the week to deal with matters other than ecology and still leave some things hanging. By that I mean the site visit. On the one hand, it clearly makes sense for me to not do the site visit until I've heard the ecology evidence, because I'll be looking at things that will be specifically referred to then. Conditions and section 106, I don't know how far they can be progressed this week or the time that we've got next week if we haven't looked at the ecology matters. So, I've told you how I want the inquiry to proceed, but there are still some imponderables and unknowns that I'm not able to determine at present. Can I check two things, sir, and make one request? <coughs> I'm assuming from what you've said that the application to exclude Mr. Clarkson's evidence is, is rejected. Sorry, say that again. The application to exclude Mr. Clarkson's rebuttal, that's, that's not... That's no, 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 no. Sir, it wasn't you, you, pursued, as you recall. Yeah, you, then, you, you're right. <coughs> Mr. Clarkson's rebuttal evidence I'm happy to, to take you. as submitted, Thank provided the, the additional information to support the Y12, 13, 14 is also submitted. Thank you. And then secondly, so you said about naturally the need to be consulted, just so that, we're, is that you envisage that you'll be doing that consulting or the count, because you've seen the terms of that. What, what I was going to say, I, in fact, I did jot it down objective. somewhere here. Um, <coughs> yes, natural angle also need to be consulted on the scheme. I'm quite content for, that consult, for the council to liaise with natural England in that regard. Could we be consulted on on the terms of the consultate of what goes to natural England because you've seen that the correspondence was I don't know, I'm trying to use neutral language um, yeah. Mr Banner he, his yeah. side should be given the opportunity yes. to thank you produce frame the question we can do it of, co of, of yeah. course I, I'm, I'm sure that between you you, yes. you, you can put an appropriate request uh, al you. along with the details of the scheme to natural England I mean it needs to be fair to both sides, so, so yes, Thank you. I'm sure I can rely on you to do that. I'd just, if I could have my request before Mr. Leader jumps in, so <coughs> it's double, double sided. But firstly, um, it's not quite got my head around where that leaves the timetable yet. We'll sort of talk through it over the course of the day. Um, plainly, it would be unsatisfactory if any witness was left in, sort of, um, we're not allowed to use the P word now, but unable to talk to their team uh, over, the, over the weekend, so i just put that down. And, uh, you recall what I said about my own position. At, at, at the moment, I'll be focusing on this application, so I'm not yet in a position to proceed with the planning and landscape evidence. I hope I will be tomorrow, but I don't think I would be with a nine o'clock start. But we can talk about that outside. The yes, inquiry, okay, but, okay. Um, all, all, all noted. Yeah. All I was going to suggest is we've got the two ecology witnesses here, and what they might do is just agree how we word a consultation with Natural England, so that Mr. Dan and myself can consider it, then we can get on with it yeah good Thank okay. you, sir. obviously whatever discussions can take place between the witnesses while while they're in the same room as it were or at least at the same venue will also be helpful and it may be that you can come back to me and and, and propose you know different time scales for, for what's uh, what's likely to uh, transpire yeah and you never know sir it may be the net result of all of this will be we will be persuaded that this is a fantastic scheme from BNG perspective and uh, we're just going to argue about HRA who knows but who knows there, there we go okay let's let's leave it like that then and we, we will need to um, I, I'll leave you to mull over what I've said but we, we do need to try and pin down some time scale here uh, both in terms of submission of the additional information from the appellant time required to respond by the council. I've, I've seen what Natural England say, that they'll, they'll respond uh, as speedily as possible, but I don't know what that means in actual terms. So, yeah. Just to finish, Mr. Clarkson, Sorry, your mic's just gone off, I think. We can make some progress. Yes. Okay, if, if you think, think that through, and, and again, I'd, uh, I'd be grateful if the parties will also just consider some of the practical things that I said a moment ago with regards to um, how much progress we might be able to make on conditions, section 106, and the timing of the site visit. As, as you know, when, when things were going uh, on plan A, if I can put it that way, and we were going to be here next week, and I was going to, we, we'd hear evidence 
and do conditions, etc., on Tuesday of next week, and I do the site visit on Wednesday. I mean, Tuesday and Wednesday are, are, are still available to us next week. Um, you're not available on Wednesday, are you? Well, I don't know, sir, because a colleague of mine is um, dealing with an application to adjourn the matter today. So if, All right. if, if he fails, I'm free next Wednesday. Okay. Well, uh, uh, again, without revisiting the, uh, the draft timetable, I'm, I'm unclear. What, when I worked it out on, on, on my plan B earlier, it looked as though we, we might manage to get things finished this week that we could reasonably do this week, but that might be a bit of a stretch. So it might be that we do need to come back for a short while next week and then come back at a later date, as I've just said, to deal with biodiversity and ecology. Okay, well, if, I think that's all we can say at the minute. If everyone's content that we move forward on that basis, uh, it does mean that the next thing we've got to do now is the, um, the housing land supply round table. Um, is everyone in a position to move seamlessly on to that? Do we need, we don't need any more time? Yeah, sort of sh papers. Sh shuffle papers, but I, 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 I won't formally no. adjourn if I just, so, so what, what seating arrangements? I, I just assume because everyone's mic'd up here, people will just stay where they're currently sitting and um, we'll just work through the agenda that died, well, the composite agenda. I, I, I sent a very brief agenda in uh, response to a more detailed one that I had seen. Um, but, but, but in essence, the only thing that I was slightly unclear on was, um, I think it came back from the council, the um, suggestion that it would also be helpful for some introduction of witnesses. So. Sir, I will be very brief in that respect because I reflected on what I was proposing and really all I want to do is establish Mrs. Richards' credentials in a way that I think would be difficult through the round table process itself but leave it there. Mm -hmm. Is that all yeah, right? That, that's fine. M Mr. Banner, were, were you envisaging doing the same with, with your witness? Just to... Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Well, it, it, it's 10:48. Um, I, I, I will we'll just have an adjournment. Then, then it'll be easy. Well, let, let's just say 10:55. So it's just over five minutes. Just give people time to shuffle papers, etc. So, 10:48 now. I'll adjourn. We'll resume at 10:55. Thank you.
Well, the inquiry is resumed again, ladies and gentlemen. <coughs> um, so we'll move through the housing round table discussion agenda. Um, if I briefly say, I mean, it's a fairly straightforward agenda, um, but uh, I'm hoping that we'll uh, obviously discuss the housing requirement situation to start with. Then on housing supply, the uh, appellant supplied a list of disputed sites and perhaps stating the obvious, I would hope that we can just work through each of those sites. I want to hear from each side um, what they say the latest position is and what evidence there is to support that view and that position, how reliable and how up to date that evidence is. Um, is there an agreed position between the parties on that site? Um, obviously then leading on to sh should that site be included in the five year land supply and if so how many dwellings could it reasonably provide? So I mean all, all fairly obvious and straightforward but that's what I'm hoping we'll be able to do and then having gone through that in, in summing that up I'd like to know what the final position of each party is and we'll see whether that's a position agreed between the parties or whether you're going to be taking different views and then obviously there may be other any other matters just to consider at the end. Um, what, what I suggest when we get started if it's going to be convenient to do it this way um, Mr. Patterson Neild um, your the one disputing the site. So I think I, I would ask you to, to lead on each of the disputed sites and hear what you say and hear from Ms. Richards to the response. Uh, the only plea I would make is give me some time, please, because it's quite constrained up at this top table um, and there's a lot of documents I'm going to need to spread out. So it might be a bit of shuffling going on. But let's, let's make a start. So Mr. Leader, you wanted to have a brief introduction. If I may, sir, the object of this exercise is to take no more than 30 minutes to introduce Mrs. Richards to uh, explain to you why it is you should trust her when it comes to evaluating uh, the deliverability of these sites and to make a brief observation on the housing requirement. That's it. So, Mrs. Richards, you produced a proof of evidence. You set out your qualifications and experience at the start of that proof. And if I could just go to the second paragraph of your statement of qualifications and experience, you see you've got 15 years experience in local government, development management, 15 of them in a planning policy research, monitoring and evidence context. Now, I'd just like to pick up there, please, because what I would like you to tell the inspector about is what exactly that planning policy research, monitoring and evidence context means in practical terms and what it is you know about the individual sites that are being contested by the appellants in general terms. Why should we trust what you have had to say in your evidence? Okay, so as you've set out, um, it's been a considerable amount of time. I've worked here for the council, all of this within North Somerset. Um, I'm involved with these sites right from the very start. We, as a planning policy function, identify draft allocations, then we follow these sites through the plan making process, examinations, adoption, and then I follow their progress through to delivering. So I'm part of a team that looks at monitoring of SIL and leads on section 106 trigger points and monitoring for that purpose, invoice raising. It's all part of delivery intelligence and I personally visit these sites myself. I know them, I look at them at least annually, all of them. Um, and for some of the strategic sites, obviously, more often than that. I work closely with various services and case officers, um, part of external stakeholder groups, meetings about these sites, talk about them on a daily basis. A good example of that is the Locking Parkland Stakeholder Group. That's one of our strategic sites. It's got a focus on delivery and community. It's not just housing, but also the wider sense of delivery infrastructure. This is attended by myself, other council officers, parish councils, the developers, uh, Keir Construction, who are project managing delivery of the roads, for example, housing associations. 
Um, as I mentioned a moment ago, Section 106 monitoring is also part of my role. We're monitoring the progress of delivery, commencements, occupations of these units. Um, we have a separate function within the council that I work closely with, that's development and placemaking. That's a function that seeks to bring forward and expedite delivery on council-owned land. Um, and our strategic developments team who deal with the planning applications for these, I attend their meetings regularly. So I've been watching hmm, housing delivery over time and seeing the improvements take place. Just, just pausing there, um, you've told us about the various stakeholder groups that you're a member of. Um, are the HCA on any of those groups? The HCA are part of the Locking Parkland stakeholder group. I should have said Homes England. Homes England yeah. and St Modwin, yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, um, out of interest, um, does a representative of the appellants sit on any of those groups? No, they don't. There used to be what was framed as a joint delivery review board, also covering their strategic site at the Western Villages. Um, since coronavirus restrictions took place, none of those meetings have happened. As I understand it, one of their directors meets regularly now with our director of place. If, if, oh, so I ask you the direct question, does Mr. Patterson Neal take part, or has he ever taken part in any of these uh, delivery groups, what would be the answer? No, he hasn't. Right. So you are about to move on to the improvement in delivery. Now, just uh, for the inspector's note, how has housing delivery improved in the last three years? What have been the three relevant HDT results, please? So the most recent one was published in January of this year. That was an 89% result. Um, last year's result was 81% and the year prior was 78%. These are all set out in table seven of my proof. Yeah. Just pausing there, we see that steady delivery. Two questions. First, what does the improvement in delivery mean in terms of the way in which you calculate housing land supply? Because of course the inspector will recall that the uh, pre-inquiry meeting, the council's position was it had a 4.8 year supply, it now says it has a 5.6 year supply, why is that precisely? So there's been no change to the supply of sites. The change is a direct result of that housing delivery result of 89%, meaning that we no longer have to apply a 20% buffer to the land supply position. It's reduced now to a 5% buffer, and that's agreed between the parties. Now, now a couple of further short points, then um, we can stop. First... If I were to say to you, look, the improvement in delivery that's been recorded over the last three years, what is it, in essence, that underlies that improved performance? What would be the answer? It's twofold. The first part being the delivery at Western Villages. That is improving. Um, as I said, it's a major strategic site. It's covered in detail in my evidence. There's significantly more units under construction now. There are volume, num numerous volume house builders, such as Persimmon, Taylor Wimpy, Bellway, all building out parcels of land concurrently. And secondly, would be the adoption of the development plan in full back in 2018. That allocated a new package of sites, if you like. Um, and it's taken time for them to come forward and through the planning system, but they are now delivering in spade loads. Yeah. Just thinking about delivery in very recent times. We have the improvement in the housing delivery test. Yes. To what extent has improvement in the housing delivery test um, been in any way affected by COVID-19? How did COVID-19 impact upon uh, housing development in Western Sudan? So the initial lockdowns did caused the construction industry to stop building. Uh, the housing requirement, the housing delivery test, sorry, results do take account of that and make a discount for a part of the period. Thank you. Right, last question before um, I complete your introduction. The housing requirement is going to be discussed uh, in the round table session, so I want to keep this short, please. Um, to what extent do the parties agree upon the way in which the housing requirement should be calculated, as far as you're aware? 
Mr. Paston, Neild and I are in agreement that the standard method for calculating local housing need ought now be used as the adopted core strategy housing requirement is in excess of five years old. And following through that standard method calculation, we're agreed on the calculation and the output. The five-year supply requirement, when you take account of the buffer, is 6,946 dwellings. And do you agree on the buffer? Yes. We do. Thank you very much. Well, sir, that's as far as I wish to go, because the other matters will be canvassed by yourself in the roundtable session. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Banner, did you wish to do a similar exercise? Yes, sir. Um, <coughs> what Mr. Patterson Neal has done is put together some sort of overview comments. Um, because we weren't quite sure what the council had in mind by their sort of slot. So um, I'm going to ask Mr. Patterson Neal to, to provide that over. You're obviously conscious that you know, there's particular agenda items, so we're not going to duplicate. He has got a, he's got a note to himself. We can provide that to save your pen, <laughs> you, or, or he can read it out as you, as you please. However, yes. Yeah. So. Yeah. Sorry, Johnny, yeah. Thank you. Uh, good morning, sir. Good morning. Um, just by way of uh, overarching comments, if I may, uh, without talking about any sites, and obviously we'll come on to that. Um, the appellant's position is that, uh, as you know, the council does not have an NPBF compliant assessment of local housing need as required by the framework. And in terms of paragraph 11D, uh, I say the development plan is not up to date. And I say that for three reasons. First, that the requirement policy CS13, which as you've heard was adopted in 2015, is over five years old. But importantly at that time, the inspector who heard that examination uh, concluded that it did not comply with national guidance in that it wasn't a full objectively assessed uh, assessment of housing need using the whole housing market area at that time. Secondly, the intention clearly set out in the, in the plan that you will have seen is that there was a requirement to review and it was at the time anticipated the West of England Joint Development Plan would be the vehicle for doing that. The Council has, of course, now withdrawn from that process, as you'll be aware. Uh, but in any event, the plan indicates that the policy should have been reviewed by 2018. Obviously, that's not happened to this point. And thirdly, the inspector uh, noted, and it's, it's in the supporting text of the policy, that the, the housing supply policy is an interim position only. Uh, and then uh, on top of that, uh, my conclusion, as, as you'll have seen from my evidence, is that there is also a shortfall in the five-year supply. Uh, the emerging plan, just, just briefly, I think it's worth touching on this um, for your reference. It's not expected to be adopted until 2023 at the earliest. Uh, this re represents a year's delay on the uh, previously published LDS and would effectively mean adoption five years later than that envisaged in the core mm. strategy. Now, importantly, the, the new draft plan is also falling short. Um, by way of an update, the preferred options plan was presented to the Council's executive on the 2nd of this month. Uh, I don't believe it's in the core documents, but if it would assist you, uh, we do have hard copies. I'm sure the Council have hard copies as well, and okay. that could be provided too if you find that helpful. Yep. Um, the draft plan, very in, in brief, uh, it's intended to be consulted in March and April, I believe, uh, uh, so very uh, in short order. The draft plan proposes 20,000 and 85 dwellings. That's using the 2021 standard method figure of 1339 per annum, which is slightly different to the figure that we've agreed mm. here, um, because we're now using the 2022 um, base date, and we'll come on to that. Uh, but the plan actually proposes 18,046 dwellings. That's a shortfall of just over 2,000. Um, but uh, an important thing that I've done is, is sort to look at um, the developments uh, and the allocations which are rolled forward from the current plan into that new plan um, and the sites that are relied upon as contributing to the delivery of that new plan and that new plan's base date will be 2023 onwards and there is a significant disparity because I've calculated there are some 1289 dwellings that feature in the council's f current five-year land supply trajectory that's before this inquiry, which the council assumes will be delivered before or by March 2023. However, those units are also expected, when one looks at the local plan preferred options, to be delivered post-2023. Now, 
both can't be right, obviously. Um, either local plan is a more realistic assessment from the council of delivery, uh, or later delivery, or the council's double counting um, to suit its purposes. I don't know which it is. Um, but if the council's position on its trajectory remains as they've presented to the inquiry, there, there must inherently be a further shortfall in, in the forthcoming local plan. Now, you may say that doesn't go firmly to the heart of five-year land supply and this current discussion, but I think it is an important point to note that, as we'll talk about in terms of past delivery, the council has uh, a picture of failure in that regard, but of equal concern is going forward, the council is not identifying sufficient land in its forthcoming plan. And I can provide, uh, suffice to say, sir, if, again, you find that helpful, I can provide a note mm. how, in terms of how I've arrived at that figure I, and <coughs> identify those particular sites. I, 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 <coughs> only if it's helpful. I think it would be helpful to have that. Obviously, uh, Mrs. Richards will be able to comment on it if, if appropriate. Thank of you. Of course. So, as I say, the council's falling short in the future, but also in the past. Um, uh, we've heard already uh, Ms. Richards um, confirming what she characterises as an improved position versus the housing delivery test threshold. But, of course, that still represents an ongoing failure um, as required by paragraph 76 of the framework. Anything, of course, less than 95% requires an action plan, which the council uh, produced last year and will be producing another one, I imagine, during the course of this year to assess the causes of under-delivery and identify actions to address those. The council has achieved 13, uh, only has, sorry, has only achieved 1389 dwellings, which is the annual requirement now uh, required once in the last 40 years. Uh, and that was at the peak of the economic cycle in 2007 and 8. Uh, and more recently, more latterly, um, 13 consecutive years of shortfall against its own housing targets. That's set out in my table one uh, in my proof. But yet now it asserts that it will achieve that five years in a row. Since 2006, the council's achieved effectively an average of 818 dwellings per annum. Uh, that's around 58% of the uh, annual, the current annual housing requirement. Um, I'll just note that there is an error in my proof in paragraph 5.5. I did say 50.9%. It should actually be 58%. So that's my paragraph 5.5. Just, just, just bear with me just while you're there. If you've... Paragraph 5.5. Yes, at my main proof. I think I didn't update it when the buffer changed. <laughs> I'd already drafted it, so my apologies, but it, it should be 58%. So just, just tell me again, the in 5.5, what's...? Uh, the, the achievement of um, the average delivery of 818 since 2006 per annum equates to 58% yeah. against the current annual requirement of 1389. Okay, thank you. Now, the council's housing requirement, by their own words, is a very challenging target. That's set out in their housing requirement paper, which is a topic paper to the forthcoming local plan. That's, for your reference, CDE6. And, and underlying that, and uh, we'll hear, obviously, we'll talk a lot more about the Western Villages. You may have seen those already, sir. Um, a key part of the council's supply, uh, and indeed the council, uh, it, it equates to 30%. So almost, almost a third of the, the entire housing land supply. Uh, in 2019-20, the, the most recent monitoring year, only 95 homes, or well, 14% of that annual mm. uh, delivery occurred on the Western Villages. And obviously, as I've outlined in my evidence, it's quite an important distinction um, uh, when we go through the sites in terms of the onus, uh, uh, particularly on the council, to justify inclusion of major sites with outline permission, or sites allocations without planning permission, when compared to so to, to sites with detailed consent uh, or non-major development, as you know. Uh, and the hanging lane decision, in, in my, which is referred to in my evidence in paragraph 4.29, uh, uh, deals with this point in its CD reference G1. And of course, the PPG reinforces that. I've covered that in paragraph 4.19 of my main proof, that for sites with outline permission or allocations, one requires further evidence to consider uh, deliverability, uh, including such things as the, the current planning status, whether there's been progress towards submission of an application, progress on, on assessment, site assessment work, and clear relevant information about viability 
ownership or infrastructure matters. Uh, and of course, build out rates and lead in times, particularly on large sites, is also a relevant consideration. Uh, the Sun in Common decision, which I've referred to, again, is in the core documents, CDF3, which I cover in my paragraph 4.33, uh, confirms that clear evidence must be something that's cogent as opposed to mere assertion. There must be strong evidence that a given site will in reality deliver. So my conclusion is that the council has 3.2 years supply, and obviously we'll go through the components of that. Uh, the magnitude, in my view, is, is, is clearly material and bears on the weight to be given to the benefits and disbenefits, which Ms. Bentham, in due course, and the council's corresponding witness will, will address as part of the planning balance. But the Hallam land decision uh, is a helpful uh, reference there in my paragraph 4.35 uh, in, in terms of the significance of the magnitude of any short form. That's reference CDG3. Uh, obviously, the appeals site that we're talking about does not form part of the council's five-year housing land supply, but it's noteworthy that in their annual assessment, pre previous, most recent one of, of April 2020, the site was and did feature um, within that housing land supply. That obviously predated the current appeal process. Uh, moreover, the rugby club, which again you'll hear quite a bit about, which is, sits immediately to the north of the site, uh, does not have a planning permission, nor a planning application, nor a confirmed allocation. And therefore, the only way that this allocated site can deliver is through this appeal process. Uh, that's the appellant's case. Um, and my view is the council has a serial track record of, of delay and failure to bring forward MPPF compliant policies, as well as a failure to uh, sustain a five-year land supply, and there's a ho ho host of appeal decisions that's in the evidence, I won't go to that now. But I'm concerned that the Council's produced, particularly a, a housing land supply trajectory, uh, which it accepts that that time had not discussed or engaged with developers or landowners to check those assumptions. Uh, and that's stated in, in the document itself. Um, and that's a particular concern when there's an endemic position of shortfall against delivery. The Council, unfortunately, has failed to heed the warnings of previous local plan inspectors to the core strategy and the site allocations documents as to the high level of uncertainty, particularly regarding the Western villages. Um, my table and graph in my appendix 28 seeks to provide a, a tabular indication of a, a series of projections across different points in time, going back in time where the council indicated at various points, this is what they anticipated would happen uh, versus what did actually happen. I've set it out in a graph and a, and a tabular form to assist you. Uh, but it is evident that uh, it will not deliver the level of housing requirement anticipated uh, in the time required. Um, so those concerns of, unfortunately, of previous inspectors have come to pass. Uh, there are several reasons for this, in my view. Some are, of course, market-related, market absorption, competition, and indeed supply issues now facing all developers. But the council of course has a responsibility for their view of delivery, which in my view is unrealistic and, and aspirational, uh, which has failed to be achieved, particularly, of course, as the council is a landowner in the Western Villages, it has a direct role in delivery and advancing development proposals in addition to its statutory role as planning authority. And the failure to review the local plan, of course, by 2018 mm -hmm. in terms of the housing requirement is clearly a factor, uh, equally so, the time it takes and has taken the authority to determine reserve matters. So I've uh, done some research looking at the Western Villages in particular and the succession of reserve matters approvals that exist across the various parcels. Uh, I've also, you may have noticed, produced a plan or a couple of plans in my appendices, which uh, I did really to assist you, sir, in trying to create a visual picture of all these parcels and where they, they sit, and hopefully that might help you uh, in familiarising yourself with the various parcels. Um, so the, the, the determination, sorry, uh, forgive me, of reserve matters application has taken an average of 41 weeks per reserve matters at the Western Villages. And obviously, there are outline permissions in place, and that's significantly in excess of the statutory 13-week period. Uh, but also, the discharge of planning conditions is, is taking time. So this, uh, unfortunately, has been augmented by, um, to quote the words of Lord Gill in the Suffolk Coastal case, reliance on allocations and outline permissions without clear evidence of delivery and the futility of, of, of doing so without prospect of delivery in five years. So that magnitude, in my view, I characterize that as serious and significant uh, and has very material weight in this appeal. So in summary, um, I, I conclude that 
there's no compliant MPPF housing policy uh, for delivery and therefore diminished weight should be given to those policies which uh, are most important um, for the supply of housing, which in particular here, for my purposes, uh, there, there are others, of course, relevant and important to this appeal, but specifically here, CS13, the scale of new housing, and CS14, the distribution, both, of course, uh, policies which relate or prescribe the level of housing growth uh, or their distribution or relate to settlement boundaries and, of course, controlling of development out with such boundaries. So they are, in my view, most important policies for determining this appeal, amongst others. Um, so therefore, my conclusion is paragraph 11D is, is engaged and the tilted balance applies in this case. Um, and, of course, the appeal should be allowed. But obviously, we'll go on to, to go through the site. So hopefully that's just a helpful overview of the... Yep. the macro position if that if that helps you and I'm happy to provide uh, all parties with a copy of the note that I've just been reading from yes that's helpful thank you so, um, ask you this yeah. um, I'm entirely happy that the note goes in because it sounds like a summary of Mr. Pastonell's proof which is fine um, the only thing that I would say is this in relation to the double counting issue uh, the new evidence, as it appears, um, becoming a bit of a serial issue, I would expect that insofar as any of the disputed sites, which is of course what we're here to talk about, uh, are affected by any double counting, that to be drawn to our attention now, right. not held over for another time. And if Mr. Pastor Neal's got any observations to make about double counting in relation to disputed sites, um, I think probably before we start, we ought to know which ones they are. It may be that he doesn't have any comments to make about any disputed sites, in which case we just get on with it. But I think if Miss, Miss Richards is going to be bounced by that, that would be unfair. It may be that the issue doesn't arise. It may be that other sites are affected, but perhaps we could be told before we start. Okay. Mr. Patterson, are you able the, to respond there? I am. Um, the, the sites, uh, bar one, are all sites uh, with detailed consent. Uh, none of those relate to uh, sites that we dispute. Um, the, the exception to that is um, Winterstoke um, Haywood Village in the um, Western Villages, where the council's position in its trajectory differs from that expressed in the, in the local plan in terms of the contribution that site's expected to make post-2023. Um, it doesn't um, directly affect the evidence uh, in terms of the reasons for um, the quantum of delivery that we say from that site. Uh, so I think it's a broader point about future um, adequacy of, of uh, okay. supply, uh, both within and beyond the five-year period. So I make that point more broadly. So I don't, I don't think it, it's of a particular disadvantage, but I have copies of which I can circulate now. Yeah. If that assists. It would be helpful to have them. Yes. That's very helpful, sir, because we, we obviously don't have to worry about it. Good. Okay. So forgive me for not raising it earlier, but the, the local plan papers have only recently, very recently been published, so, so it's a, it a point we've come to latterly. Since it doesn't affect the evidence, I'm really quite relaxed about it. Thank you. Okay. Right, I'll put that. Thank you. Okay, anything from either side before we look at uh, housing requirement? No. Nope. I think what I picked up there in um, in your rebuttal evidence, Mr. Patterson Neil, you, you um, highlight um, differences between what uh, Ms. Richards said in her evidence and, and what your position is. So let me have that rebuttal in front of me and you just take me through that, please. Or l largely, I understand that uh, from what was said earlier, there's agreement between the, the parties on this position, so we don't need to spend two too long on it, but it'd be nice for me to just note what that agreed position is. In, indeed, I mean, I think there are, there are two things to look at. One is the draft agenda, the, the, the more detailed agenda that yep. um, Ms. Richards and I put, put together uh, and, and issued uh, prior to your uh, simplified agenda, if I can put it that way. Um, the 
the proofs of evidence, and to be fair to Ms. Richards, uh, were drafted, the original proofs drafted prior to um, uh, clearly understanding the position, uh, the adjustment, if you like, to the base position of 2022 to 2032, which is the standard method update that occurs every January um, to the demographic starting position for that calculation. So there's a, there are minor adjustments. And as you know, sir, in the spring, there'll be another adjustment when the uh, affordable housing ratios get updated. So all these things do do move on from time to time. So uh, in my rebuttal proof, I just sought to explain uh, yeah. the update, which hadn't been accounted for. But following that, uh, the, uh, Mr. Richards and I uh, have liaised before the inquiry began. And, and really what's set out in the draft agenda, I think, hopefully encapsulates uh, clearly. We had a discussion about rounding. And thankfully, we've, we've agreed on something, so we don't need to trouble you about rounding of numbers. But, but we've set out the maths there. I don't necessarily think the inquiry needs to spend time going through that. But suffice to say, we've, we've arrived at the 1389. Um, and when you include the sort of um, point two of that, it mathematically adds up to 6946. Um, yeah. uh, and that's the, the five-year position. So that the parties agree. And as, as you've heard, we agree on the buffer position, which, of course, is derived from the housing delivery test uh, result published uh, last month. So, so that, I'm happy to report, is, a, is an agreed position. Yep. Okay, so, so what I see on the draft agenda towards the end, the 1389 requirement, um, five years, that, that includes the 5% buffer, and we've got 6946 as the final agreed five-year figure correct. for the requirement. Okay, yeah. that's good, thank you. Well, I say we don't need to spend any, any longer on matters that are agreed then but let's let's move on to the extent of disagreement on supply and I'd, I'd put them largely in the form that was uh, provided on the information from both of you is split down into those different types so large sites with detailed planning permission let me get my note so I've I've got two that you were disputing here, is that? that That's correct. correct. Yeah. So, the former TJ Hughes store, just remind me where I'm going to find the information relating to this in the evidence from both sides. Of course, uh, so paragraph 6.14 of my main proof on page 31. And I think page so. 18 of uh, Ms. Richard's appendix NR3, which is her schedule of commentary on the various sites. You could have that right. hand. So, so sorry, bear with, bear with me. 6.14 6 in your proof. Yes, I'm, I'm there. And you refer to... Where are we? Sorry, Mrs. Richards, your... Yes, yep. for each of these sites, I'll be able to give you a page number from the appendix that Mr. Passer Neil referred to. It's my appendix NR3. Yep. And for this site, it's page 18. Within that page document. 18, yeah. I've got a feeling that, um, yeah, <laughs> going through your appendix, some of them are the wrong way round, if I can put it that way. So I'm going to have to do even more paper shuffling, but uh, well, not, not to worry. I'll, I'll, I'll say no just from the point of view that I, I may well annotate as we go through, and so it'll be easier to do it on, on the version that I've got, got here. But thank you anyway, Mr. Leader. Yeah. Okay, so you want to kick off then, Mr. Patterson, Neil? Thank you, sir. The TJ Hughes site reference 4 slash 649, um, uh, very close to where we are sitting. Um, full planning permission was granted in June 2018. The reference is in in my proof. Um, the decision notice is attached at my appendix 8 uh, for your reference and that development needed to be begun by the 31st of March 2020. Um, that event has not occurred. Uh, the permission has now expired. Uh, there's no um, fresh application or planning permission for that site uh, and therefore I've discounted the 19 dwellings entirely from the supply as there is no um, clear progress towards the submission of an, any new application and no uh, permission that enables the development to occur now. So 
uh, in my view, there's, uh, that site should be discounted from the supply. Okay, let me just turn to 18. Okay, Ms. Richards. Thank you. Um, as the appellant asserts that this expired during the base period, um, it had not. He hasn't taken account of the gov.uk guidance on extension of planning permissions throughout the coronavirus pandemic. Um, so that had the effect of developments which, sorry, permissions which were due to expire were extended by the provisions until the 1st of May 2021 and a number of them that had expired were reinstated. Um, this issue will come up again under the small sites section. Um, it's a public document on gov.uk. I do have copies, should anybody mm -hmm. wish to have them. Um, so that means at the 1st of April 2021, this was still a live planning permission. I accept that given it hasn't commenced, it would now lapse at the 1st of May, which is during the monitoring period. However, it should be noted that the site does retain its allocation status, and as per page 18 of my NR3, the council's housing team are in discussions with a registered provider to bring this site forward for affordable housing in the short term. What, what about any figures there? If, if I take Mr. Patterson Neal's view on this. I've got to discount 19 from the housing supply. You, you say that the, there's discussion with a, uh, a registered provider. Yes. What, um, I would consider 19. What, what extent? Uh, yeah. is that, 19 I would still consider to be an accurate figure on the basis that the intention is to retain a active commercial frontage on the ground floor. The previous scheme was for apartments above, um, given some fairly tight constraints, um, and that's what the registered provider are seeking to produce a scheme for the, the same for apartments. Okay, so the council's position on this is 19 are still deliverable within the five year period? Yes. Mr. Patterson, any? Uh, I was obviously aware of the, the coronavirus uh, regulation. Uh, the fact remains that my assessment, of course, is that whilst, yes, at the point the monitoring um, statement was produced, or the base date of it, albeit it was, that was actually produced in November, um, mm. so that permission had expired when it was actually published. I appreciate the base date of it, of the 1st of April, that permission was still extant at that time, but of course now it's not. Um, I, I hear what uh, Ms. Richards says um, because she hasn't been able to confirm who that applicant is. Uh, there is no written information or evidence before the inquiry uh, as to that scheme. It is, of course, as, as rightly indicated, a, a mixed-use development with uh, other uses at ground level. Um, uh, the Council has not presented any, any evidence as to why that permission has lapsed. There's obviously some challenge with that site, difficulty, where we don't know what that is. It could be a viability issue. Um, uh, but there's no scheme put forward, so uh, there's no uh, clear basis for assuming that 19 would be the right number in any event. Uh, but I don't believe that the Council's uh, evidence is sufficient to give uh, a realistic prospect that that site will deliver. Ms Richards, anything further? No. No, I mean... Again, to state the obvious, we're not necessarily going to be agreement between you on this. I just need to make sure that you've uh, both given me your, your up-to-date position on it, and then obviously I'll have to form a view in due course. Okay, thank you. So, so the next one, sir, is Golden Acres Fruit Farm. Yes. Site so reference 701. 701, just bear with me, in Golden Acres. So, so this is... 615 in your proof. Just trying to find the page number in your. Uh, 57. 57 Sorry, 57 or six. Yes, 57. 57. So this, this uh, relates to a site where uh, planning permission uh, was granted on the 13th of May 
2021 for 18 dwellings. Decision notice is attached. Um, it was approved, therefore, beyond the base date um, of the monitoring period. Uh, and as I've set out in my paragraph 615, it's not appropriate to include what was effectively a windfall site after the 1st of April uh, without rolling on the requirement for another 12 months. One is effectively taking advantage of, of complementing supply without a corresponding acknowledgement of, of the extension, if you like, into a new annual period for the housing requirement. In other words, will be, again, apologies, there's an error in my proof there, 1607, I've indicated should be added, that, that was when it was a 20% buffer, it should be 1389, you know, another annual uh, uh, quantum of, of housing uh, for another 12 months. So one yeah. can't claim the benefit of adding in further permissions which have occurred uh, after the 1st of April 2021, and therefore those dwellings should be deducted from the supply. Okay. That's, that's something that I haven't referred to in my proof, but in um, the um, Woolpit decision, um, core document F2, um, for your notes, sir, is, is helpful here. Um, that appeal, paragraph 67, dealt with this point of a cut-off point um, stating that sites that have received planning permission after the cut-off date but prior to the publication have been erroneously included. The inclusion of sites beyond the cut-off date skews the data by overinflating the supply without a corresponding adjustment of need. That's why there's a cut-off date. So that's okay. my position. So, Ms. Richards, your comments and particularly on this cut-off date point. Yes, of course. Um, so. This is essentially the opposite of the last site we spoke about where it was asserted that it should have been taken out. Um, this one was issued its decision notice in May. I accept that. Um, it did have an internal resolution to grant consent in advance of that date. Um, and page 57 of my NR3 sets out my clear evidence as to why it is deliverable. This site is already now under construction as email confirmation from the developers to that effect. Okay. Okay. Anything further? No. No, sir. No. Okay, thank you. So... So we move on, I think, to large sites with outline planning permission. Four stroke five nine six. Um, so that's land north of Youngwood Lane, Nailsea. Yep. That's right. So that's now on page thirty two of my evidence, and I think page yep. sixty three. Sixty three, is it? Yes. Thank mm -hmm. you. Right, so, so I've got your 32, so let me get to 63. Okay, thank you. Thank you, sir. So this, this site actually appears twice in the trajectory in two different categories because part has detailed consent um, through reserve matters approval and part doesn't. It was an outline granted yeah. in November on appeal in November 2019 for 450, uh, but a subsequent reserve matters approval for 168 uh, in March 2021 uh, was obtained, uh, and and therefore it, it, it falls into two categories. It appears in the in the large table um, NR two three NR two <laughs> twice. Um, I, I take no issue with the 168. Um, given they have detailed consent. Uh, my uh, concern is with the further um, 200 homes that the council says will deliver within the five-year period beyond that with detailed consent. There's no detailed permission for those units. The applicant proposes two further phases, uh, and in my evidence in Appendix 10, I've included the design and access statement so you can get a visual impression of the part that has the detailed consent and the part that remains. Uh, the design action statement for Taylor Wimpy, the, the developer there, has indicated 
the further 282 units will be subject to a detailed application at a later date. Uh, now, of particular note, and I've identified this in my paragraph 618, is planning condition 21 of that outline, which relates to a uh, prospective link road uh, and an elaborate condition which um, requires a reserve matters applications to have regard to uh, and consider the alignment and potential or, or safeguard the alignment of a link road across the site, which broadly runs east to west across the site. Um, and it's on page 18 of my appendix 10, which gives you a sense of, of where that is. Now, at the time of that reserve matters approval, uh, the council had not um, confirmed the alignment and therefore a safeguarded route is identified as required by the planning application. So the point I'm making here, therefore, is that um, the applicant safeguarded that potential route, but there's uncertainty remaining about whether that link road will be needed. Now, that will impact on the timescale and, of course, the detailed design of that subsequent phase. Taylor Wimpy are not going to uh, deliver a road which requires a certain specification and alignment if it doesn't need to be developed in that way. It may impact upon mm -hmm. their net developable area. They would quite rightly wish to conclude and understand that with precision what is happening before they advance that reserve matters. Um, so there is uncertainty at this stage. There's no evidence put forward by the council for um, the time scale uh, or delivery of those additional units uh, in any event. Um, now, if, if so, you, you, as I've indicated in my paragraph 620, you, you don't uh, accept uh, my evidence on this point. The delivery rate here is also relevant that uh, the dwellings predicted in years four and five of the five-year land supply period are 100 per annum, and um, they're, they're over and above what's being delivered or anticipated for that part, which currently has reserve matters approval. Um, so if you do consider the sufficient evidence for the inclusion of additional dwellings, they should be at the similar rate, i.e. around 50 per annum. So that would add 50 rather than 200. So I say 200 should be deducted, uh, but in the alternative it would be a reduction of 150 yeah. uh, if you consider, because the, the current reserve matters is going to be built out over the next four years effectively. Um, and at, at some point, obviously, the developer will turn to the rest, but it, in my view there is insufficient evidence um, to determine there's a realistic prospect and, and clear evidence of delivery of, of those additional units. Okay, so either, you know, appellant's view is I, either a reduction of a full 200 or um, 150 on that. Okay, and Ms. Richards, what's, what, what do you say in your page 63 and what's your position on this then, please? Yep. So, as Mr. Patterson Neil quite fairly explained, phase one of the wider site is under construction. Uh, Taylor Wimpy purchased this whole site after it had secured outline consent. They're aware of the road alignment that needs to be safeguarded. Um, and as was pointed out, they're proposing to deliver the southern part of this site. It's the northern end that's being built out at the moment under the reserved matters consent. The southern part will form two separate phases. Hence, the increase from a build rate of 50 from one phase to 100 per year for the two remaining phases um, with two show homes, presumably. They're marketing the whole development at the moment as Netherton Grange, I believe, um, and there's plots already listed for sale. It's under construction. Um, it's not a realistic prospect that they will stop partway through. Um, as I say, the wider site does have outline consent secured at appeal and it's Taylor Wimpy's intention to secure planning permission to then keep building phase two as and when their phase one starts to come to an end. Okay. okay. Anything to come back on? No. Okay. So. So the next one's there is Land off Trendlewood Way, Nail Sea which is on my page 33 and it's Richard's page 64. So, your, <coughs> your page 33, sorry. Just yeah, the foot um, of page 33, six, site, site 595. 64. Yep, okay. Thank you. So outline permission on this site was granted in August uh, 2021. Um, Further to the point I made earlier, the, the um, approval is, of course, beyond the monitoring period. However, 
Um, this was already formed part of the council supplies as it was an allocated site for 30 homes. So I fairly acknowledge that that can be inclu included because it was already part of their supply and the, 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 um, uh, the uh, permission um, uh, is obviously a, a relevant to, factor to consider. My concern with this site is that this, this site is um, uh, the, the outline permission was granted. Uh, there's no, there have been no applications to discharge planning conditions. Uh, there's no detailed uh, application on this site. The applicant was uh, a pair of charities, Brunel Care and St. Peter's Hospice. Uh, the land um, is lo lo known locally as Shepstone Fields. It was bequeathed by a lady to the two charities. Uh, JLL uh, have been marketing the site uh, and subject, uh, a sort of subject to planning basis. And that process was, took place in the autumn of last year. Uh, I've undertaken a recent land registry search so the charities still remain the site owners. Um, now, plainly they won't be developing the site for houses, uh, obviously hence the marketing exercise. So there are a number of actions still to be required. The completion of the sale to a developer, uh, the preparation of a, an application, um, the, the detailing of technical work associated with that, subsequent discharge of planning conditions. But as, the, as matters stand, there's no clear evidence that the council puts forward of progress towards the preparation of, of a detailed application, nor information regarding its time scale for delivery. Um, and therefore, I've deducted 24 dwellings from the supply. Okay. 24, so it's page 64. So, Ms. Richards, please. Thank uh, you. Um, as was alluded to, the site has recently been granted consent. Um, the land is for sale. There are no constraints to its delivery. I appreciate there are outstanding conditions that would need to be discharged in advance of it coming forwards. Um, in our trajectory, we've allowed three years for the site to be developed. Um, there's an inconsistent approach slightly from the appellant in that some of the other outline consents with similar conditions to be discharged are accepted um, and some of them are discounted. So I stand by the proposal that this is a deliverable site and will deliver 24 units within the five years. Okay, so if, I, it was clear, if I'm clear on what you said there, you're saying that the situation that applies with this particular site, there are other similar sites that, uh, that the same applies, that, but the appellant has been content with those. Is that how you, you worded it? That is the yes. The land at Bridgewater Road site, it's referred to Mr. Patterson Neal's evidence. So that's actually the following page in my evidence and his, I believe, um, where similarly he refers to a number of conditions on an outline permission, um, but it's accepted that that site is deliverable supply. Okay. Mr. Patterson, Neil, any comments there? On, on that site, I, my view is there's a material difference there. Uh, Vistry Partnerships are um, going to be the developer. Um, they have already discharged some planning conditions. Others remain to be dealt with. Okay. But there is a clear indication of progress and momentum to bring that site forward. So I do believe in, in that site, as I've indicated in my evidence in 624 and 625, that there is a realistic prospect that site will deliver for the reasons that I've set out. Okay, thank you. The next site there is land west of the M5, east of Trenchard Road in Weston. So 4702, I'll, I'll just jot the number down, it's easier That's than right. the, the whole description. So just let me, so this is your, your page 35. 35 and 66. And 66. Okay, thank you. So outline permission was granted in November 2020 for 75 homes. Um, the application was made on behalf of uh, the Hayes family and Mr. Cope, so not a developer. Um, reserve matters must be approved by November 23. Um, to date, no reserve matter application has been uh, brought forward uh, and no applications made to discharge a series of conditions which I've listed. Um, this site is 
adjacent to the M5. Uh, noise attenuation is a significant issue in terms of detailed design. Uh, the site, the whole site lies in a zone where noise levels are in excess of 60 decibels a day and at night closer to 75. So there's a, there's a, a challenging technical solution that will need to be addressed. There's no clear evidence of progress towards an application. Um, or realistic prospects of delivery within five years. Now, I've dealt with this in my rebuttal as well, sir, on page three. Rebuttal paragraph seven, if you have that to hand. Uh, I've had your rebuttal a moment ago. <coughs> it's, it's now disappeared. Sorry, the reference in the rebuttal? Uh, it's page three, uh, R7. Oh, yes. Yeah. So uh, uh, this is my, my response to the council's evidence on, on this point on page 66. Uh, reference to a planning consultant advising an application could be submitted in 2022, but there's no evidence to support this. It's unclear on what basis that can be stated given that the site has yet to be sold to a developer. Um, so... Uh, in my view, that doesn't change my position that there's no clear evidence of delivery or progress towards an, a detailed application or a timescale for its delivery. Uh, and with those technical challenges relating to the detailed design of that site, uh, my view is there is uh, uncertainty remaining about its, the timing of its delivery. Yeah, okay. So, as Richard's... Um, Thank you. Could, well, uh, could be submitted. Is there any... Could. That was as a result of a telephone conversation with Grassroots Planning, who are the consultants for this site. Um, so the extract I've put on my page 66 is actually taken from their original outline um, planning application, where it was asserted that this site ought to be approved to help with the five-year supply. Um, following that, as I say, I spoke to Grassroots Planning, who advised that they are preparing a planning application they expect that that could be submitted by the end of this year. Um, I'm in no doubt that one will be submitted at some point. As I say, they assure me it could be this year. The site has been put to market. Bidding has now closed. And as I understand it, the selection process is underway. Okay. Mr. Patterson, Neil, any, anything you want to come back on there? Uh, I think the only point I'd make is um, the council hasn't put forward any written evidence to confirm this position. Uh, and as you know, uh, the PPG um, makes reference to uh, the expectation uh, in terms of the robustness of, of evidence which is to be expected. Uh, and that could include a written evidence of, of agreement of, of delivery, uh, technical work being undertaken, and that's, that's not before you, sir. So, um, in my view, that, that's not consistent with the approach advocated by the PPG. Ms. Richards, anything further? Yeah. Only that the PPG advice is, you know, ev clear evidence may include and a list of suggestions. I'm giving evidence um, on facts and conversations in this particular case. Um, clearly, we email all of the developers. If they don't reply in writing, they're followed up by phone calls. Mm. Okay. Okay. Let's, let's look at the next one. Uh, next site, Sarah, is Oxford Plasma Technology. Site 524. So my page 36. 524 and 68. Sorry, the page in your? 36 and 68, respectively. Yeah. Okay. So outline permission on this site was granted in November 17, uh, 55 dwellings. Uh, reserve matters were required to be submitted by November 2020. Um, the site, um, the delegated report at the time confirmed the site was occupied and is still occupied by a manufacturing company that needs to find an alternative site. Uh, the company in question um, announced in February last year they were relocating to Bristol. Uh, Construction is underway um, through the course of, of last year, expected to be completed this year for their new premises. 
Uh, thereafter, no doubt, they will obviously be vacating the current premises. Um, but the time for the reserve matter submission has passed. The permission has elapsed. The site does remain allocated. Um, but in my view, it should not be included uh, as there is no, is not available now for development. Uh, the planning permission has expired. Uh, in, in due course, a new proposal will need to come forward, but that's not been advanced at this stage. So there is no, again, there's no evidence, uh, written confirmation of time scale, delivery, uh, and so on. Uh, and the council doesn't offer anything further in that respect. So I've, I've removed 55 dwellings from my assessment of the supply accordingly. Richard. Thank you. The site is owned by Red Row Homes. Um, as Mr. Patterson Neil suggested, this business have been seeking to relocate for quite some time. They've been supported by the council's economic development team to try and find alternative premises that they have done. Uh, their site is under construction and they expect to vacate their current site shortly. Uh, this remains an allocated site and there is a real prospect of the delivery of the 55 dwellings within the five-year period. I have them within year five of the trajectory, um, and I still maintain that that is a realistic prospect. Okay. Anything to come back on? No? No, sir. Okay, thank you. Next one, sir, is site 690, land south of Station Road. Yeah. Which is page 37. Yeah. 69. Okay. So the planning permission, uh, outline permission was granted uh, on appeal um, in July 19 for 13 dwellings. Uh, reserve matters must be submitted by July of this year. Uh, no application has been made. No application is made to discharge conditions. Uh, there's no evidence provided by the council of progress towards the preparation of such an application, nor information about its time scale uh, for delivery. Um, I've dealt with this again briefly in my rebuttal, page four, R8. Uh, the council relies on the appellant statement from the appeal uh, in 2019 regarding delivery. And I, I don't regard that as, as sufficient um, in terms of the evidence that the council should be required to demonstrate for the delivery of, of this site with, with outline permission. And therefore, I remain of the view that there's no realistic prospect demonstrated for delivery of the site within five years. Okay. Okay, Richard, so the, <clears throat> the evidence from the council on this. Yes, this site um, was granted on appeal. The appeal actually ran almost in parallel to the Kongsbury Neighbourhood Development Plan um, examination, which identified the site as a housing allocation. Um, it then secured its consent for the 13 dwellings. It's a local developer, ironically called Richard's Developments, nothing to do with me. Um, who are, have secured the consent and intend to deliver this themselves. Um, as I say, their original is set out in my evidence that their original housing statement of case sets out their intention to deliver within five years. Um, it's another example where I have spoken to them, but no, I do not have that in writing for you today, um, where they intend to deliver it themselves within the five-year period. Okay, thank you. The next site, sir, is 703, land west of Wolvers Hill Road, yep. Banwell, my page 37, and page 70. So this relates to an outline planning permission uh, granted on the 13th of May 2021 and was subsequent reserve matters application submitted in June of last year for 54 dwellings. Um, 
application, as I understand, is yet to be determined. Further information was requested and submitted in December, just gone. But notwithstanding the progress made with the application and the detailed application that's followed it, um, it was approved beyond the base date. Uh, again, since the point I alluded to earlier on, it's not appropriate to add in what, again, is a windfall site um, after the 1st of April uh, without rolling forward the requirement uh, correspondingly. So 54 dwellings should be disregarded from the supply because they're introduced post base date of the monitoring period. Okay. Ms. Richards. Thank you. And largely the same point as earlier. Um, this decision notice was not issued until May. However, it was resolved to approve the application in advance of that date or recommend it for approval. The reserve matters application was submitted shortly after um, and remains under construction. It's correct that amended plans were received in December 2021 to address a couple of design related concerns. Um, and at page 70 of my evidence is an email from Strongvox Homes setting out their timescale for expecting to complete the development. Yeah, okay. Okay, thank you. Next site, sir, is F. Sweeting and Sons. That's site 682. Sanford. 682, yeah. Now, my page 38 and 71, respectively. Yep, okay. So this is a, an allocated site, um, previously used as a haulage yard, storage of HGVs, outline permission granted in March 2020 for 16 dwellings. No reserve matters application has been made or application to discharge conditions. Uh, however, this site uh, is, is quite an interesting one. Since that approval, further permission has been granted in respect of a temporary change of use of the land um, for use as a park and ride, associate expiring at the end of this calendar year for the construction of the nearby Sanford substation, which is all part and parcel of the additional infrastructure to carry power to the Hinkley Point C and C Bank Power Station project. Uh, the case officer, as I've indicated in my para 6, 35, the site has outlined, the case officer noted the outline permission for residential, uh, the site contributions to supply uh, would be delayed if it was used as a park and ride facility, albeit on a temporary basis. So an application has been made to discharge conditions relating to that temporary uh, alternative use. It's not, there's no clear evidence towards the preparation of reserve matters. In my um, rebuttal, R10, I acknowledge that the council confirms the site is now on the market for residential use and indeed being used on a temporary basis for those substation works. On that basis, there's no clear evidence of preparation of reserve matters uh, or an indication of uh, any developer interest being secured. Uh, therefore, no detail regarding timescale for delivery uh, and therefore it's not a realistic prospect that it will be deliverable within the next five years. Okay, so... So it's 16, 16 dwellings, isn't it? That's right. Okay. Ms. Richards, the, uh, the implications of the temporary park and ride, etc. And uh, Thank you. So the outline consent for housing is still live. Um, the previous use, the haulage yard has ceased and the site was cleared. The temporary park and ride use for the nearby project is a temporary project. Um, I have spoken to the planning agent, page 71 of my evidence sets out that the client is marketing his site for residential use to deliver the extant consent. Um, I have asked to speak to the landowner directly, I'm still awaiting that correspondence. To take account of that, within the five year supply, I've put in a cautious estimate, the temporary use is for three years, however I've got the completions anticipated on that basis within five years, so year five of the trajectory, and I maintain that 16 units are deliverable supply. Okay. Okay, thank you. Um, so the last of the 
large sites. The last of the outlines is Bleeden Quarry, uh, 586. Yeah, my page 39 and 72, respectively. So this site, Sarah, as, as the name suggests, a former quarry uh, allocated in the site allocations plan. Outline permission um, was granted on behalf of Marshalls Mono, who's the, the occupier who's now, I understand, vacated the site. Formerly used as a manufacturing and distribution facility for concrete landscape products. Permission granted in March 21 for 42 dwellings. No application for reserve matters made or applications to discharge conditions. Uh, I do note the trajectory assumes 48, but of course the permission is for 42, so whatever view you take, um, there is only 42, not 48, hmm. as suggested by the council. Um, the site has a previous outline approval for 42, which expired in 2019, so there is evidence here of a site where permissions have previously expired, um, which is a, obviously a relevant consideration for you, sir, to, to consider the the robustness of the evidence presented by the council in this in this particular case but in my view there's no clear evidence towards the preparation of a reserve matters application nor time scale for delivery again that the site will be deliverable within five years so too much uncertainty remains uh, about its prospects and site as i say has a history of of, of expired um, of an expired permission okay So 42 or 48 and... and uh, it should be 42 on the basis of the approved outline planning permission. Um, as was mentioned, this site had planning permission previously. That did expire um, because Marshall's Mono, the previous occupier, took longer to relocate to Newport than was expected. Um, that has now happened and they've secured the new consent. In between the consents, there were some pre-application discussions for the possibility of 48. That's where that number came from. Okay. But the approval is for 42, that's correct. Um, as I mentioned, the quarrying operations ceased November last year, and the site is being sold. That was confirmed by the planning consultant, James Gibbs, back in November. Um, and I maintain that 42 units are deliverable within the five years. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Right. So now looking at uh, strategic sites, I think. Strategic sites, Western villages, yes. Yes, sir. This, this um, has broken down, the council breaks this down into a number of component parts uh, and it has a sub reference I mean it's 558 but there are sub reference numbers to the different yep. parcels of land A, A to C is the first that's one, right so A to C is locking parklands so just by way of context a uh, number of permissions on this site um, a full permission in March 2010 for 250 uh, and then outline permission granted for 1,200 in July 15. Uh, for, for the outline, a total of four reserve matters have been approved. They're listed. Uh, and then there's one additional application which is live and remains under determination um, with the authority. That's Curo Homes. The others relate to St. Modwin. So to date, there are... 309 of the 1,200 through the outline approved, which have reserve matters approval. Uh, and taken together with the original 250 um, under the full permission, or the two earlier full permissions rather, there's a total of 559 with detailed permission out of a total of 1,450 overall. Um, the trajectory indicates um, a certain number, as I've indicated, that have been completed I pause there because I, in my rebuttal, I've obtained correspondence from St. Modwin, uh, which I've appended to my rebuttal, which simply confirms their projection in terms of delivery of, of their parcels. Uh, they have two different elements. We'll come to the other one, which is Parkland's moss land, but it, that email sets out their trajectory. There is a minor difference in what they regard was 
um, the base position of units completed at April 2021 from that presented in the council statement. It's not significant. Um, I made a minor adjustment to my to my numbers, uh, but they don't bear you know materially on, on on this case or the overall conclusions. I think either party would draw from it. Um, and I take no issue, of course, with those elements which are under construction or have reserved matters approval. I've also looked very carefully at the Cura application. Um, there's, uh, there are no, in my view, no substantive issues. I've reviewed the correspondence on the Council's website. I don't believe there's any substantive issues of, uh, of concern re relating to that application. It's a relatively small parcel surrounded by infrastructure that's already been delivered and completed, so it's quite an easy parcel to, to bring forward. The, whilst it doesn't have permission yet, um, and therefore it can't begin uh, the 124 dwellings, it's reasonable to assume they will take place within the five-year period, uh, as well as those remaining unimplemented from the other reserve matters approval. Um, what I take issue with is the further 767, um, that, um, of which the Council assumes another 424 in its trajectory will be delivered by 2026, but there's no evidence to support those parcels coming forward, um, no information about reserve matters proposals, uh, their delivery or the timescale for those. So, um, as I say, I've, I, I've reduced the number accordingly in, in, in my assessment to be limited to that which has detailed consent, has been constructed or has reserve matters approval, uh, but also including the current reserve matters application has yet to be determined. Okay. So, the, in, in summary, your the appellant saying that 424 should be removed from the supply figures, 424. Yeah, it's actually 422 because of 422. Two, two different <coughs> in the what St. Modwin say that it was completed at, at the end of March, but minor point, but, but essentially that's correct. So. Okay, so 422. So um, I'm not sure I'm on, on the right page in your appendix. Uh, which page should I be on? Yeah, this one is page 74 from my evidence. Okay, yeah. So I won't read you out the figures. I don't think it's helpful. They're all set out there. This is a site controlled largely by Homes England and St. Modwin. Um, of the total site amount, 467 of the units have already been completed to date. Um, and I've set out there the assumptions that we've made in relation to previous base rates, how we've rolled that forward, um, and engagement meetings that I've attended with the Locking Parkland stakeholder group, where St. Modwin confirmed that phases 12A and 5 are scheduled to complete within six months of the date of that meeting, um, and the update from Homes England in relation to the next reserve matters. That's the Curo one. Um, these meetings happen frequently, albeit less so during COVID. The next one is scheduled for April where we will review the figures for the next monitoring year. Um, but as it stands, that rate that I've got in the trajectory, um, we don't consider that all of these will be built within five years, as is set out there. I've got the 90 that are under construction, forecast to complete by March, followed by 100 and then 150 per annum, which is a perfectly reasonable build rate for a site of this size. Um, and then 343 of them anticipated beyond the plan period um, and they will be rolled forward essentially into the new emerging local plan. So 343 post the plan period, how, just so um, I can check the figures later, are, are, what, what, what are you saying with regards to the 422 that uh, uh, the appellant says shouldn't be included? How does that relate to your 343 three, post I accept they're not the, the I'm, I'm not trying to say they're the same figures, but I just want to be clear that I'm following what you're, you're telling me. I think the <laughs> appellant's table is saying that it's 767 beyond the plan period, which is where the difference uh, of the 422 arises. Yeah, yeah. Well, I suppose that if, I, if I may, I mean, Ms. Mrs. Richards, the difference appears to arise from your um, view of the likely trajectory, the completions each year. Yes. So why is it that you say your assessment of the number of completions each year 
in the relevant five-year period is greater than that projected by Mr. Patterson Mill. What, what's the difference between you? Why do you think your rates are more likely than his rates? Having seen these developments coming out of the ground and the amount of units now under construction and the considerable efforts by all parties to boost housing supply, I believe that this is clear evidence that these rates will be achieved. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so obviously I'll look again at the figures later, but what you're telling me there is that uh, I, I shouldn't be removing 422 from the supply, uh, is, is the council's view? Yes, my columns set out in grey on the table effectively remain my position for those build rates. Sorry, your comments in? Sorry, the columns in grey which represent the North Somerset figures on the disputed sites schedule. Yeah. I've been trying to, 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 to limit the number of uh, bits of paper I've got open at any one time and here. I've got you. Yes, that's helpful. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Mr. Patterson, Neil, anything? Um, come just back to make on? A, a, a point which is, which is one that uh, is a sort of a repetitive point, if, if you will, which um, I'll just draw your attention to core document F5 which is the Horsham appeal decision, if you have that to hand. Okay. Um, which, um, you don't necessarily need to turn it up, but just for your reference, um, I think this, this exemplifies the concern that I have, that there's reference in paragraph 59 of that decision to um, the need to have robust and practical supporting evidence, which is that which is referred to in the PPG, which I mentioned a while ago. Um, concern about reflecting the challenges around gaining reserve matters approval. I've already taken you to the average time it's taking at Western Villages, 41 weeks. It's getting on for a year. Um, and in some instances, in excess of a year, it's, it's taking. Um, Persimmon have, have, have indicated to me that they assume 18 months from the point of putting a, a reserve matters application in to getting starting on site having regard to the time table uh, to go through that process is 18 months. Um, that's obviously a real concern. So absent of any information before you and evidence of dealing with the discharge of conditions, the timing and the submission, preparation, and consideration of reserve matters, um, that is why I say there is considerable uncertainty. And that the, the Horsham decision also, also makes reference to, in paragraph 64, concern there about generalized aspirations and how they're not a substitute for practical, robust evidence uh, to support um, the, the, the evidence that, in, in my view, national policy requires of you, sir, to conclude on a site without detailed consent to a major site that that will deliver those additional units that the council asserts. So that's, that's the backdrop, really, mm -hmm. to, to the position that I'm taking. Okay, Mr. Leader, I can see that you want to... Okay. Go into so it. Just, just to try and pin this one down, because obviously now we're moving on to the larger sites, it's quite important we spend a little time on them. Could I invite you, sir, to pick up the schedule that indicates the differences between the parties, where you've got, if you like, the grey, the pink, the green, and the brown? Because we're going to, I think it's yep. going to be helpful to look at that. Have you got that? I've Have got it, it here. Mrs. Richards. Yes. Right. If we look at the site in question. We can see that under construction, as of April 2021, we have 90 units. Correct. Mm -hmm. And we see that uh, completed in 2021, we have 36. Yes. Now that 90 units that are under construction results in you anticipating 90 being completed in the current year. And indeed, we have Mr. Patterson there agreeing with you because he says 92. Yes. Yep, right, good. But then where we start to depart uh, in terms of our level of agreement with the appellants is in the following year, where you see 100 being completed, yes. whereas the appellant sees delivery dropping off to 26, quite a significant difference between you. And then in following years, you see delivery accelerating to 150 per annum, whereas Mr. Patterson Neil sees 50-50, then nothing at all. Yes. Right. Now then, can you help the inspector in this way? Um, Mr. Patterson Neal obviously takes a very pessimistic view of what's going to happen in a very short time, whereas you're being a bit more optimistic. Well, what exactly is it that underlies your optimism? 
What are the hard facts that you are aware of which indicate to you that between Homes England and St Modwin, we're going to see an improvement in delivery, not delivery falling off below that which we're presently experiencing? because they say so, and the infrastructure delivery coming alongside these housing is supporting that. So there's been a spine road put in within the last year or so. Uh, primary schools are open on, one primary school is open on this site. Reserved, uh, sorry, planning application has been approved for a secondary school on this site. Uh, work is ongoing to look at delivering a GP practice and health facility. The infrastructure going in at this level supports these houses coming forward, and that is the rate that's anticipated. Okay. So your point is, I think, but just to summarise, you've got roads and other facilities being built, and you'd be a bit surprised if that wasn't then to be paralleled by an increase in housing delivery, that infrastructure being there to facilitate it. Correct. That's there to facilitate the boost of housing. <coughs> Excuse me. Yeah. Ms. Passanil. I think um, that you, I don't know whether you visited I haven't. Western Villages, I'm sure you, you probably wish to do so, uh, uh, not as part of the site visit obviously, but just, just, just generally, and you'll, you'll, see, you'll see the position for yourself on the ground. Um, it's right to say that infrastructure is being brought forward, um, that's as a matter of fact, but I think the correlation asserted there in uh, Ms Richard's response to Mr Leader's question uh, of, of a, an increase in delivery as corresponding with that infrastructure is, I think, speculative uh, in my view. There's, there's no evidence before, before us. I think the St. Modwin uh, email in my rebuttal is, is quite instructive in my view because it clearly sets out a, a much lower average of unit completions on their two parcels that you can see on, on the table. So that's reflective of the pace and cadence, if you like, of delivery. Uh, and we just don't have the detail before us to, to support, in my view, that, that suggestion of an accelerated position of delivery. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay, we'll move on to the... Yes, sir, if I may. So the, the, the next one is 558F for Foxtrot, uh, Parklands Mossland. Um, this is... Uh, being delivered by St Modwin. Uh, the table I was just referred to does cover this. Outline permission was granted in... So, sorry, just give me the, the reference in Sorry, your... I beg your pardon, forgive me. Um, page 43. If um, we're yeah. referring to the disputed site schedule, we've gone slightly out of order, I think. Mm -hmm. Sorry, yeah. yeah. Um, <coughs> I, I want... Uh, I was just going in the order of my evidence, but I'm happy to take it in, in a different order. Do you want me to skip to D, sir, or guided um, by you? I've, I've started writing about F. Just bear with me. <laughs> Sorry. Well, we, we, can, we can do... I, I did it on the basis of geography, because it's yeah. kind of next door, but anyway. <laughs> let's, let's do it on the way, on, on the schedule. So let's go to D next. Okay, so that's land south of Churchland Way. Now, I've considered this with G. <laughs> Sorry, just to add to confusion. Uh, yes, I'll, D I'll, and G together, you've considered. Yeah, because they, they're, mm. they're side by side. Uh, they relate to different planning permissions, um, but on a practical basis, as, as I'll explain in a minute, that they're, they're, I think they're sensible to consider them together. Um, so outline permission was granted in 2015 for D, uh, and there have been four applications for reserve matters, uh, which have been granted consent, two for Taylor Wimpy, one for Bellway, and one for Mead. Uh, that's a total of 586 dwellings of the 1,150 uh, approved an outline. Uh, and I visited the site on the 3rd of December. Taylor Wimpy and Bellway are both constructing new homes on their respective parts of the site. There, there is a separate outline permission, which is G, which was approved in 2017 for 250. And of that, there's a further reserve matters approval of 88 dwellings from February 2020, so that's my paragraph 653. Yeah. And because they physically adjoin each other, and my, that, the, the plan that I've produced uh, in my appendix to, to illustrate the geography of, of that, you'll see them effectively side by side. They are effectively, and as I've indicated in my paragraph 654, Taylor Wimpy have combined those for operational purposes, construction 
as one development served by one construction and sales outlet. Um, so for monitoring purposes, I've, I've combined the two sites together. So my table in Appendix 7 brings, brings the two together. Uh, I take no issue with um, the reserve matters approvals for Taylor Wimpy and Bellway Homes, and I've included correspondence in my appendices 22 and 3, emails from them to Mead Realizations, who, who uh, I met with and their uh, planning representative, planning agent, uh, Mr. Dewson, to discuss the delivery of, of development at this part of the Western Villages. Uh, there is a letter in my appendix from Mead um, explaining their position. Mead are the controlling interest and they have sold the various parcels to the, to the other developers progressively. And they've indicated that um, there are a range of matters for them to look at, ground conditions and the, the need for, for surcharging of, of the ground uh, to prepare for construction. Uh, they are looking to deliver uh, the, the, the link road that Ms. Ms. Richards referred to. There's a sort of final piece of that, um, and I think northern northern end, yep. get my geography right, um, has yet to be completed, and that that's being discussed. Uh, that's to the Morrison's roundabout. That's on hold. Um, Mead are looking to replan their site, and they're not looking to bring forward that. Uh, I've got a mini table, my table two, sir, on my page 44. Yes. sets out my position, which is essentially the, the build-out of the Taylor Wimpy and Bellway elements that have reserve matters approval uh, through the corresponding permissions, uh, but no further development. And that's on the basis of Mead's position that they're not looking to, to bring forward their parcel for 77 units. They're looking to replan that. Uh, there's still time. They've got plenty of time left on their consent. They've got a 10-year window to put reserve matters in. So they've got time to, to bring forward additional development. So for the reasons that they've set out, um, that they're retaining that balance of the remaining parts of the site and they're not bringing forward any further proposals in the five-year period. So I've um, reduced um, 512 plus um, 250 units when you combine the two sites together from the trajectory. So, so sorry, all, all together that you're, you're saying 512 plus 250 should be reduced from the... Sorry, big bud, it's just 512 in aggregate, big bud. The 512, that, that's yes. inclusive of the 250, so a reduction yeah. of 512. Yeah, that's what I thought. So, yeah. All Mrs. Richards, are, Mrs. Richards' answers, can I just make sure I've understood, because I'm probably being just slow and need sorting out, but I thought it, I thought Mr. Patterson said that the 88 on G approved under reserve matters, uh, there was no dispute as to that. I thought that's what he said. I'm, I may have got my note wrong. If that's right, as I look at the schedule that we're all working to, and I look at the line 4558G, there's a series of zeros. And I'm just wondering, have I misunderstood his evidence? Or if the 88 in relation to the reserve matters application is agreed, should there be an 88 in there somewhere? I, I, forgive me, that's very good. Very fair question. I've, I've combined the two together in one row of the table so as to not double count in my table. So I've, I've put them together in uh, basically as part of D rather than... Okay, so the 88 side. is on the table, but it's subsumed into the it is. D That's, that's how I've dealt with it. And my, my table too effectively um, sets out on the basis of Taylor Wimpy's own stated position, the delivery of those two sites combined. Where is the 88? Well, it's, it's assumed because, as I say, Taylor Wimpy are on a practical basis developing the site as one, uh, and, and therefore their numbers include elements from both those parcels. They're not split out. So I've, I've set out in my table to the, the delivery based on the correspondence from Taylor Wimpy in Appendix 22. So, so in effect, the, fi the figures starting 133 and ending with 74, you're telling me there's 88... In, in there. They're mixed within. Over yeah. there. mm -hmm. That's essentially what Taylor Wimpy is saying they will deliver in a five year period. Okay. Well, if, if I may, I, I'd be very interested to understand, just for my notes, when the 88 uh, in relation to 558G are to be delivered. When, when does it start and when does it finish? Well, 
Well, as I say, the construction is, is being considered as one, one entity on the ground. So uh, the numbers that I have from Taylor Wimpy don't distinguish between the two. But that is re rep the reality is that's representative of the overall delivery on their land interest. Okay, so the, so the 88 isn't disputed, but there's, no, there's, there's nothing I can see on the paperwork I've got in no, front of me here to show down, no. where that spreads out. No, unfortunately okay. not, sir. Okay. That's just the way they've reported their, their data. Okay, so Mrs. Richards then. Okay, so mine have been retained as two separate mm, rows, if you like, 558D um, and 558G. They independently link back to the original outline, so that's how they've been presented in that way. So for 558D, um, my appendix, page 75, refers. This is a site where 91 units were completed within the last monitoring period, which is quite impressive despite the COVID lockdowns and downtime off of site. Um, and 323 units were under construction at the time of that survey. So as Mr. Pastor Neil said, there are multiple house builders delivering. You've got Bay Bellway and Taylor Wimpy, both delivering phases. Um, so I've rolled forward those units and those anticipated build rates based on what is being seen on the ground. Um, it's worth noting that the reference to Mr. Dewson and Mead realizations providing evidence to Mr. Patterson Neild, um, they are the appellants for the next inquiry, which deals with five year land supply. Mm. Back on 558G, that's the one we're talking about with the 88 units, which have reserved matters consent of the 250. Um, they're dealt with on page 78 of my evidence, and I've kept them separately with a build rate of 50. 50, 75, and 75. So sorry, let me <clears throat> catch up with that 50. I've got your 50, 50, and 75 in. Yeah, so I've got that 250 as deliverable supply on the basis of the outline and reserve matters consent secured, and I've got the 250 within the five years. Okay. So put simply, the council's position is that I shouldn't be considering reducing by 512. Yes, that is my position. Those set out in the trajectory I maintain are deliverable supply. Okay. Okay, thank you. So papers here. So if we've done, so we've got um, E and F still to do, is that correct on the, the schedule? Yes. So now I'm so sorry for the nuisance, um, I promise not to do this too often, but if we could just go back please to 558D. Sorry, 558D. D. D and G. D and G. I'd just like Mrs. Richards's help, if, if I may, just to make sure I've understood the evidence, because I probably haven't. Um, you say, Mrs. Richards, that 323, 323 units are under construction, yes? Yes. <laughs> if we look at Mr. Patterson Neld's um, trajectory for D and for G, bearing in mind the two are combined, I just want to make sure I understand the realism of what he's saying. Because, you see, if, if there's three, two, 323 houses under construction today, yes. and we look at what he anticipates in terms of actual delivery, we've got 133 in 21-22, 139 in 22-23, and 80 the following year. Do you see that? Yes. So it appears that if you, if you take Mr. Passanel's view of the world, 323 under construction, they add up, broadly speaking, to what he anticipates being delivered over the next three years on both sides. Yes. Yeah? Mm -hmm. And then we have 80 and 74 in the last two years. Now, how long do you think it's going to take to deliver the 323 dwellings that are actually being built today? 
roughly two years, so they're set out in my trajectory as those 323. Bear in mind that's back at April 2021, yeah. so it's actually now more under construction. Yes, quite. Um, but I've got them roughly over a two year period 157, followed by 161, and then where I deal with the 250 and keep that as a separate record. Yeah. That's listed back down below. But so, what we'd particularly ask you to note in comparing the two sides. Uh, views of delivery on this, on, on this site, this combined site, as you, if you like, is the fact that if you've got 323 units under construction today, or as it was actually, because there's more under construction today, as Mr Richards has just said, the likelihood of those houses as being built actually being spread out over the three years in the way that Mr Patterson now suggests uh, is well, unlikely. That's the, that's, the, that, that's the view we invite you to take. Okay. Mr. Patterson-Neil, any uh, just, comment back just on to that? Just respond, if I may, um, uh, what I would do is direct you to my appendices 22 and 23, respectively. <coughs> I think the important point is that the clear evidence before you, sir, is from those two respective developers. Mead are not delivering and constructing houses themselves at present, so it's the two proponents are Taylor Wimpy and Bellway, respectively. Bellway will build out their parcel because it's relatively small. Uh, so it's a moot point in terms of their actual rate of delivery. It will clearly happen within the five-year period. Taylor Wimpy have a, have a broader interest, uh, but I am relying, relying on the numbers that have been provided uh, by those developers as being the, the, the correct position. Um, so, so that is the evidence that I um, present before this inquiry. Um, and I think beyond that, it's, it's speculative in terms of uh, any other position that might be derived in terms of number of units under construction. There's no further written evidence to support that. Okay. Okay. Let's look at. Um, Did you want to go to E next, sir? E, yes. So this is Parklands, south of Lockheed. Just, just let me get the. Forgive me, sorry. So juggle, juggling the paper. So E. Page, page 45. Yeah, your 45. My Ms. Richards, no doubt, will help me with. 76. Thank you. Mm -hmm. so 45. Yep, okay. So this, this parcel uh, relates to um, land um, where the council has ownership. An outline uh, permission was granted in 2018 for 700 dwellings. Uh, there is a live reserve matters application that Keep Moat Homes submitted in April of last year for 425 homes. Uh, that is the only application uh, for dwellings, uh, which is currently on, on the table for detailed consideration. Uh, the council um, does not rely on the delivery of any other part of that site, so the remaining 275 is not in their trajectory. So the difference between us here is the council's assumption that the, the 425 um, will be delivered within the five year period, and I uh, take the view that only a proportion of that will be delivered in the five-year period. So this is, a, this, this is a single reserve matters application, still under consideration. So there are, as I've indicated in my paragraph 657, there's a series of outstanding issues and concerns from consultees, such as flood risk, the police, uh, the parish council, Wessex Water, the council's ecology team, urban design officer, tree officer, highways, and so on. Information was submitted by the applicant on the 14th of December, just gone. Uh, I have no further update uh, on the council's website. But the, the applicant there had anticipated a start on site, is the important part really about when this will deliver, in September 2021. Obviously that's now passed. They don't yet have their uh, detailed consent. It's unlikely therefore there'll be a start on site within the next six months in my view. Uh, they need to obtain the permission and discharge relevant planning conditions and then um, 
get ready for site implementation. Mm. Um, the, so the, de the delivery start assumption, the lead in, oh, sorry, the delivery of the site will be later than envisaged is the first point. The second point uh, is that I do accept that it's likely that reserve matters approval will be obtained. Uh, I'm not doubting that, but it's clearly taking longer uh, to come to fruition. Uh, the second point is that um, is one of the delivery rate. Um, I've referred in my appendix 25 to uh, a press article which uh, made reference to Homes England funding to help uh, bring forward this part of the Western Villages. It's reference to the Link Road, which Ms. Rich has uh, referred to, and other infrastructure, with an expected delivery of at least 85 dwellings per annum. Now, I take the view there'll be no completions possible clearly in the current housing monitoring year, which we're almost about to end. Um, but at best, going forward into the next monitoring year, I, I do accept that a permissions likely to be forthcoming in 2022. But at best, you're really looking at a, a part contribution to the next monitoring year starting in on the 1st of April. So my view is that it's reasonable to conclude around 40 completions in that period to the end of March 2023. And thereafter, uh, up to that rate of 85 dwellings. Uh, the council takes the view that if effectively I think uh, 100 per annum will be delivered. I think that's right, um, 100 per annum. Um, my concern is no clear evidence of this and, I, and I'd just actually like to take you to the council's housing delivery test action plan, if I may, um, which is E1, E1 in the core docs, bear with me. Which is the current one, not the one they need to produce this year. We've got it. E1. Right. So this is dated July 21. And unfortunately, it's not paginated. Um, let's just work out what page it is. On page seven, including the front cover. Is it, it's it's a table. It's at the top. It says what progress has been made. Yeah. Do you have that? I've got that. Um, there's reference there to Land at Parklands Village. It's the first bullet point on the right-hand column of the table. Yeah. R refers to the keep moat application. Again, refers to the expectation of starting September last. Um, reserve matters under consideration. Expectation homes to be occupied in the summer of this year. Obviously, that's no longer realistic. Uh, but importantly, again, it refers to the build rate of 86. Uh, I've taken 85, but... Uh, whether it's 85 or 86 probably doesn't, not much turns on that. But I think it's important that the council's own action plan acknowledges that's, that's the likely rate. It, it, that's borne out from hmm. the, the, the press article which refers to Keep Moat's own um, proposal, which it says it's agreed with the council and the council's delivery team. Uh, so, that, so that doesn't, none of this supports the council's assumed higher delivery rate. So as I say, my, my point is one of a slightly lower delivery rate, which is actually evidenced in a number of places. And secondly, the later commencement of that work, given they don't yet have reserve matters approval. Uh, and therefore, uh, I've reduced accordingly uh, the number of units uh, from this site. So that's a reduction of 185 versus the council's position over the five-year period. So they will part deliver this and it will continue to deliver beyond the five-year period. So say 185, uh, uh, on the, the schedule, we've got the difference of 130. Am I, am I looking in the wrong place? Apologies, wrong, I've given you the wrong figure. Forgive me, it is 130. 130. So, appellant's view, the... Um, Supply figure should be reduced by 130, principally for two reasons, a later start and a slower delivery rate. Ms. Richards. Thank you. Um, that was all fairly accurate. Keep moat homes have been appointed by the council. They are contractually bound to deliver a minimum of 86 homes per year. Um, and what wasn't mentioned was the modern methods of construction that are being used to accelerate delivery so modular homes 
to boost that. Having discussed with the Council's Head of Development and Placemaking, we are firmly of the view that they will therefore exceed this 85 slightly. Um, and we, the trajectory there stands. We put in 100 per year for the first three years and 125 thereafter. As part of the wider site, the part which isn't subject to the reserve matters, 275 units. I've got those in beyond the five-year supply. Okay. I just wonder whether I might uh, butt in again here. Okay, Mr. Leader. Um, right. Do you have the trajectory, sir, which sets out the two parties' alternative views of the future? Yes. If we look at document E1, um, Ms. Richards, which is the action plan that was published last year, so it's not, yep. it's not the one you're in the process of working on. We see, don't we, that there um, you expected to deliver 80-odd units, 86 homes, this summer. Is that right? Have I got that right? We expected the first units to be completed this summer. Yeah. <laughs> and um, as Mr. Patterson now very fairly said, that's not going to happen. Correct. So your response in your evidence has been to um, indicate that you expect 100 to be delivered in 2022-2023, is that correct? Yes. I was Mr. Patterson now says 40. Yes. Now, um, Mr. Patterson now very fairly said he didn't think it was going to be an issue of reserve matters approval. Um, do you know when reserve matters approval is likely to be granted? It's likely to be imminent. <laughs> and you refer in document E1 to uh, the parties involved in this matter. We've got Homes England, West of England Local Enterprise Partnership, as well as the developer. Yes. And you talked about the contractual obligation. Yes. On the developer to deliver. On the developer with the council. Correct. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, um, can you tell us any more about that contractual obligation? When and how does it bind? I don't know the details of All the right. clauses. I know they're contractually bound. Mm -hmm. But no, I don't know the actual clauses. Right. Well, that might be something we pick up at another inquiry on another day. Sorry, sir. Thank you very much. OK. Can I just come in on that? I mean, that's quite a good illustration of, of why the words clear evidence are there. <laughs> if, I, mean, I, I don't need really to say much more on that. Um, Mr. Mr. Patternil. May I just make a brief yes, point? So the purpose of the, the action plan is obviously very clear and very important. Uh, and the council would rightly wish to be indicating within that plan their opportunities to seek to advance development or accelerate it if that's possible. Yeah. Um, the fact that it's clearly stated that it's 86, um, if it was a different number, they would surely say so. Okay. I'll leave it at that. Okay, thank you. Ms. Richards, have you said all you wanted to on this one? Yes, thank yeah. you. Mm -hmm. so it just seems to me that if we are able to produce your evidence of the contractual obligation, you probably ought to see it. Mm. So we'll have a look at that and we'll deliver it up in due course and it's going to be an assistance. If, if, cl clearly, if there's a, a evidence that's uh, of, of assistance, um, and uh, I would like to see it. Yeah, thank you very much. Okay. Um, right, sorry. So, uh, do we jump <coughs> back to F? Sir? Just one remaining one, isn't there? For the Moss Land. 558F, five, five, yes. Bear with me then, please. It's my page 43, sir. Page 43. <coughs> 77, is that right? Yes, 77. Sorry, 43 on what page? 77. 77. 77. Okay. 43. Yeah. Okay, thank you. So this pertains to an, another St. Modwin um, development granted in outline in 2018 for 300. Uh, the, the key point here, sir, is that Reserve Matters um, is under construction, but Reserve Matters consent was granted in January 2020 for 248. That's 52 less than the outline. Uh, I've uh, appended two plans in my appendices 20 and 21. They show they relate and occupy. The Reserve Matters occupies the same land as the outline permission, so it will be 248 dwellings delivered on this site. So I've reduced it by 52. Okay. So...
Mrs Richards. So the site as a whole does have capacity for up to 300, as is set out on my page 77. Um, St Maldwin's advised that this will be built out entirely within three years. 117 units were already under construction back in April last year, um, and that's the rate that I've based this on. There were 26 completions and 117 that were under construction. Right, so I'm, f so I'm f <coughs> following this one. Um, appellant, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> you're, you're suggesting 52 will not be completed within the five years and therefore removed. That's right, there's no consent. For, well, there's an outline permission in, in theoretically, but the, the, the reserve matters approval occupies the full extent of that land. Okay. Um, the Simodwin email, which is in my rebuttal appendix, uh, the brand, the brand name for this site is uh, Handley Place. And the bottom row of that table shows very clearly that the, the gross capacity is 248. Sorry, this is in your rebuttal. Sorry, forgive me, uh, my rebuttal, the single appendix, which is a table from St. Modwin, just confirming their trajectory. So, sorry, Handley Place, you Handley say? Handley Place, yes, yeah. the very bottom row. Yeah. Um, the, the, the two tables, the top table just splits out the subparts of the, the larger site, the one we've already talked about, the Locking Parklands one. Uh, and then at the bottom, it, it, it provides a summary of Locking Parklands as a whole with its subcompartments and, and Handley Place. And you can see it's 248 gross and net capacity. It does refer to, sorry, in the top part of the table, Handley Place Phase 1. <laughs> So what, what are you saying there? I can, I can, I can My understanding the is the residual 52 units are a further phase of the handy place development. Sorry, the residual 52 units are? It, sorry, the 248 is referred to within St. Mogwin's table as handy place phase one. The outline is for 300 and phase one there is for 248, meaning that the residual is still covered by the outline permission. <coughs> still covered by the outline and still anticipated delivery yes. within the five years by the council. Yes. Mm -hmm. Sir, if I may, I think yeah. the, the, the reference is really nothing more than it's a single phase development. Um, all I would do is draw your attention to, to this plan, which is in my appendix 20, and, follow, and corresponding plan in 21, which um, indicates the full extent of the outline boundary, which is coincident entirely with that detailed consent. And you can see that uh, I don't see any spare land on there. So. OK. Any, any comments in that regard, then, Mrs. Richards? No. Mm -hmm. No? OK. OK, thank you. Right, so let me... Having just killed off all the green ones, sir, would that be a convenient point to break? I was just going to check that we've done... There's one more, that's Mr. Leader, sorry. It was Winterstoke. Yeah, I think there's... The bottom one. It's got a different number. Four, six, eight, uh, five, yeah. six, eight, isn't there? Oh, you're the, right, yes, I'm yeah, sorry. sorry. So there is, there is one more, but we <laughs> will just be about the time for, for a lunch yeah. and a gym. I my break. ambition to get to the break. I'm, I'm with you there. But, yeah, it, it might make sense just to do this one more and then break. So, five, five, six, eight, let me just be clear on your page. Yeah, well, it's my page, your 46. Four, page 46. Yeah. And Ms. Richards, you're... 81. 81, thank you. Okay. Yep, okay, I've got that to hand now, thank you. So this is uh, Winterstoke or Haywood Village, um, promoted by Persimmon. And uh, the two, two main outline permissions, so I won't 
go through all these numbers, but 659 and 660, I list the two outline permissions granted in 2012 and 2018, respectively, for phases one and phase two, uh, of 91650 dwellings, respectively. There are a series of six reserve matters approved, uh, totaling 898. It's affected the totality of the first phase, and they're listed. And then the second phase, uh, there are three reserve matters that have been approved to date. So that's 729 of the 1650. So there's a total of 2,550 overall, if you group everything together, and of that, 1627 has reserve matters approval. 940 have been previously completed, pre-monitoring based. Uh, uh, sorry, up, yeah, and then 56 completed in 2020, 21. So that's a total of 996. So as of the 1st of April 21, there were 631 with detailed consent that had not been completed. And of that, there were 147 under construction, according to the council's trajectory. Council assumes 108, one units over the five year period, which is significantly more than the outstanding balance of the consented and unbuilt dwellings of 631. So my, my evidence, sir, is complemented by a letter from Persimmon in my appendix 26, which sets out the various parcels. Uh, and what's indicated is, is a significant reduction when considered against the council's predicted trajectory for delivery rate. So previously Persimmon had dual branded the site with the Charles Church uh, brand and that was offering a wider range of house types. Uh, but since then, the market has substantially changed. Obviously, they, um, Persimmon rather, had been advancing their development ahead of the other main part of the Western Villages that's come forward more recently. So there are now, obviously, a number of developers active in the local area that has impacted on, on, on the housing market. They've adjusted their sales mix. They've adapted their range of house types and they're no longer dual branding so they're operating uh, they're not operating with second sales outlets the council does make reference to previously a higher rate of delivery uh, and as identified in the the letter from persimmon that related to the time period when they were dealing with the local center so they mm. had a local center with some apartments together with charles church and persimmon brands all operating at the same point in time they so they had historically at a peak achieved a higher yeah. rate um, but that's not carried forward because of the way they're now delivering homes on the site, as, as explained in their letter. They face challenges, as all developers do at the moment, in terms of labour and material shortages. Um, and obviously COVID has had some, some of, something of an impact on, on their delivery rates. Um, they've recently had parcel H18 approved, uh, and that includes important infrastructure relating to access to a, a primary school. And they are considering the preparation of an application for a further parcel, uh, but they've yet to make a decision about whether they will introduce Charles Church at a, as a future phase uh, to go back to dual branding. They know that it will take an average time of 12 months to, to determine such a reserve matters, um, followed by a substantial period of works, Section 38 and 104 works for, under the Water Act, uh, and substantial infrastructure that will take place. So construction on further phases is not expected until at least 2024. So based on those comments, I could do an average delivery of, of 50 dwellings a year on that parcel. And uh, I've converted their data. There's a slight difference between their data and how I've reported it because their data, they work to a business year end of December rather than a planning monitoring April to March. So I've, yeah. I've just converted it into my table three to set out um, what I believe they will deliver over that period, and setting out the difference with the council. So I say 371 versus the council's 710. No, the council's 1081. Is that your difference is 710? Is that? Beg your pardon. Yeah, yes. quite right. Yeah. Okay. And so yeah, so the the, the evidence obviously is is set out in in that letter in, from Persimmon in terms of the way they're now. Uh, approaching that site and progressively delivering the reserve matters approvals that they've got 
uh, with the infrastructure provision and the timelines that they're working to. So, so that's a, a clear stated position of, of uh, the reality of, of, of the rate of delivery, which is, I think, the key difference here between um, myself and the council. Yeah. Mrs. Richards. Thank you. Uh, my position remains as is set out on page 81 of my evidence. I note that the letter in Mr. Patterson Neal's appendices is dated December 2021. Um, it's not clear exactly what persimmon were asked for, um, given that they're the appellant in this inquiry. They've obviously got an interest in replying to that effect. Um, I would just reiterate, as I say, it's already written down. They've achieved 242 dwellings in one year previously, and there are no reason why that cannot be achieved going forward. 147 units were under construction at the time I last surveyed. Um, Persimmon have always been very optimistic about this site. There's recent press interviews, I think it was Carly Spear, the sales director at Persimmon, who reported to the Bristol Post, I quote, she couldn't see the popularity of Western decreasing anytime soon. Um, this development is very successful. The council worked closely with Persimmon to bring it forward in a timely fashion. Um, I stand by the figures within the trajectory. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you stand by your, your figures on this one? On the basis that they match the previous build rates achieved, yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. So just for my notes, so I can get this right. I think Mr. Patterson Neld said there were 631 units with detailed consent and 147 under construction. And what I would just find helpful, so I've got this right, is to understand whether the 631 include the 147 or whether the 631 and the 147 should be seen as additional. So has he excluded those under construction from the 631 with detailed consent that presumably have to be constructed? I'll obviously let Mr. Patterson Neal speak for himself, but I'm reading his proof here and he says of these. Well, I wasn't sure. I just wanted to be clear. Yes, okay. Yeah. Forgive me, sorry, can you <laughs> repeat the question? Yeah, I'm so sorry. What do you mean? No, no, it's my fault entirely. When you gave your evidence just now, you distinguished between dwellings with detailed consent and dwellings under construction. And so what I just wanted to be clear on are the dwellings under construction included in the figure of those with detailed consent, or are they to be viewed as additional to those with detailed consent? They're part of those with detailed Thank concern. you very much. Well, I thought that was the case. I just wanted to be clear. Yes, so they are included within... Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Okay. I think... Have, have, have we said all each side wants to on, on this particular site? You have, haven't you? Yes. Thank you. Um, sorry, see so your, your light's on, Mr. Has, Daddy. Sir, I, I, I'm... I'm I, do you want to say something about this? Because I was no, just, just about, I want about to make a procedural point just before we vote for lunch. I just want to make a basic point about who's, what's going to happen after lunch, what's going to happen tomorrow. Okay, yes, right. So, I don't know if you want me to make that point now or... or no, we, so, sorry, so, say that again. I, yes, I, yeah. so, sir, so I just wanted to know, firstly, are we going to get onto the, the council's highways evidence by the end of today? Because if we are, Mr Mansell needs to um, get over here and he's an hour away, so it would be helpful to know. And, and perhaps a follow-on question from that is, is who are we likely to expect? to come tomorrow yes um, we need to make, make arrangements. You, you, you've hit me cold as it were I'm but, so but, 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 but it's a good it's a, it's a good apologize. point because obviously we're going to yes. break for lunch we need to know what's going to happen afterwards just let me try and find I've got lots of bits of paper around here as I've said before So, getting my head straight here, I'm, so, so we're, we're quite a way through the uh, housing round table, aren't we? We've yes, got that's to, what, yeah. we're, 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 we've broken the back of it, as it were. Um, we, we've still got about uh, another dozen or so sites to look at, so yes. we're obviously going to take some time after lunch. But then I was expecting us to then move on with the council's uh, highways evidence. Uh, now, are we all in a position to proceed on that basis. I, I, I am, but I just need, we need to call Mr. Mansell to get, to get here. Yes, um, okay. Yes, I am. 
Now, I, I've, um, using the estimates you've given and, and a few uh, additions of my own, I've got about an hour and a quarter in total for uh, the, the highways. Th 30 minutes in chief, 30 minutes cross-examination. Um, any questions from yeah. myself and some re-examination? So I, I got that about an hour and 15. Is that still... We're going to be better than that, sir, because my examination in chief of Mr Thorne may set a world record, I think, in terms of brevity. Um, <laughs> he, he gives evidence of a very narrow point, and I think what we've got to say about highways is picked up again by Mr Muston. Okay. So, so really, I'm going to be very quick with Mr Thorne. Well, uh, I think where I'm going then on this is, I know we've got to be out of this room by four o'clock. Mm. We're going to adjourn now, and we'll perhaps be resuming round about two. So we've got another, what, best part of an hour. Actually, that might just... Just, yeah. Does it seem likely that we're going to get on to Mr. Muston in chief at all this afternoon? Well, not today, because he's more than an hour away. Oh, that? well, <laughs> you, you, you've answered the question without me, yeah. me delving any further yes. into that one then. Yes. So, if good. Well, that's, that's what, we, we need, what we know in that case. Good. So, tomorrow would then be Mr. Muston, uh, Mr. Mansell, and Mr. Smith is ready to go. And she, if, if we need to call Mr. Smith tomorrow, he's ready to go. Yep, okay, that, so that's, yeah, that's for tomorrow, etc. Good, thank you, sir. Okay, so I, I can adjourn. I was going to take um, a little bit less than the hour. If, if I go till 2 o'clock, then that's sort of 50, 55 minutes. So let, let's do that, shall we? We still fit everything in, yeah. Okay, thank you. On that note, then I'll adjourn now and we'll resume at 2 o'clock. Thank you.